गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन वॉट वॉज द लास्ट टॉपिक वी हैव डिस्कस्ड आई थिंक प्राजेक्ट शीर्षक सो इस ऑन प्राजेक्ट शीर्षक लोन्स आर डिवाइडेड इंटू थ्री कैटेगरीज स्मॉल लोन्स लेस देन फिफ्टी क्रोर्स आर डेल्ट बाय द बैंक इट सेल्फ फिफ्टी टू फाइव हंड्रेड क्रोर्स आर डेल्ट विथ आई बी सी दैट इज इंसॉलमेंसी एंड बैंक ऑफ सिकोर्ट एंड थर्ड कैटेगरी अबव फाइव हंड्रेड क्रोर्स ये स्टडे वी डिस्कस वॉट द मेकैनिजम इज सो फॉर दैट मेकैनिजम वी आर यूजिंग AMC AIF Okay. <laughs> so, yesterday we saw what is asset management company. It works similar to a mutual fund, where we pull together money from people, and this money is invested in different AIFs. AIF. Basically, the definition of AIF is important from the uh, perspective of prelims because we are using these AIFs now. so how this aif works is usually when mutual funds were created originally when sebi was made into statutory body in 90s new type of mutual funds were you know they were coming up at that point of time for every type of mutual fund sebi used to create different type of rule but at one point they felt that too many new mutual funds are coming up and they created a miscellaneous type of category that means one rule for all the future funds that will come up so this is like a miscellaneous category of funds so that means whenever a new type of fund is created now they will check first whether it will fall into any previously made rules if it is not falling into any other rules then it will fall into this category that is what we call as alternative investment fund alternative to what alternative to the existing rules whatever are there for mutual funds that is basically alternative investment fund so as of now the definition you can see here aifs are private funds which are otherwise not coming under jurisdiction of any regulatory agency why they are saying about other regulatory agencies after actually sebi used to be an executive body they made it a statutory body after harshad mehta scam and after that there was sahara scam when there was sahara scam they realized that even now there are some areas which are gaps which are not being regulated by anybody at this point what they did was they gave some sort of a you can say <coughs> power to sebi which said anything which is not regulated by any other regulators in financial sector will be regulated by sebi this is similar to residuary power in union list you might have studied in polity who has residuary power central government if something new comes up which nobody else is actually making loss on then central government can do it similarly within financial sector if something new comes up which nobody else is regulating then sebi will regulate it and within sebi if none of the other rules are you can say regulating this particular fund then it will fall into which one it will fall into aif and that is basically the meaning of aif if anything new something innovative that comes up in the economy will always they will try to check whether it will fall in any other regulator it is not falling into any other regulator it comes to sebi within sebi they will check whether it is falling into any of the rules of sebi if it is not falling into any other rules of sebi it will come into the miscellaneous category that is what we call as alternative investment fund but what happened after we created this ai of us lot of innovations have happened and since then miscellaneous category itself has become the biggest you can say category that means most of the things that we are today regulating are all ai of only so that is the present situation so this amc will create different type of innovative type of funds where there will be dif- you know different level of diversification that means you can pull together your money and invest some amount of it in high risk or low risk or medium risk type of you can say instruments so different aifs will provide this type of opportunity for you to do it <coughs> so this is aif because aifs are today number of aifs have increased rapidly what we have done is we have categorized them into three categories of aifs based on what the externality this aif creates 
Anybody knows what is the meaning of externality? Externality is effect that is created outside. That means some sort of unintended effect that is created on environment, economy, society, etc. If it is creating a positive externality, then it will be put in category 1. That means whatever is in category 1 is a fund, it is a pooled fund, it is an alternative investment fund, means pooling together of money is happening. And finally, where the money is getting invested actually is going to create some sort of a positive impact on economy, society, etc. Then it will be put in category 1. Venture capital fund, angel fund, social venture fund, these are all startup ecosystem related aspects. Because startups are in general good for the economy in the long run. Why startups are good for the economy? Because this is where a lot of innovation takes place and they are trying to solve problems which have not been solved before. They are trying to find a better solution to an existing problem also. That means you can see because of innovation we are able to solve problems better. And that means it is possible to create a positive impact on the economy. So whatever inefficient solutions are there right now they are all improved upon and re reduction of negative impacts is happening. Because of this reason whatever is in startup ecosystem they have all put in category, been put in category 1. Apart from that infrastructure fund is also present. Infrastructure everybody probably knows that infrastructure is extremely important to the economy. Why infrastructure is important to the economy? From economic perspective, yeah, it creates employment correct that is one aspect. Imagine we are trying to build a road or something, the, to build this road we have to spend money on cement, steel or you know, stone or whatever it is and where does all this money go? It will go to the steel company, steel company will employ people, they will get no money. Then some stone crusher company, they will get the money, that means they will give their laborers. So that means the money is going into hands of people. This is increasing demand because people are getting money in their hands, demand is increasing or not. Consider now that this road is there, on one side imagine there is a big town, on the other side there is a small village, earlier there used to be some hill here and they could not access the town. Now that there is this road, they are able to access this town in half an hour, earlier it used to take 3 hours. In this case, what happens to, imagine in this village all these people, some 3, 4 thousand people are there now. They have now extra opportunity to produce something else. Earlier, imagine they were just um, watching some TV serial, now along with watching TV serial they are tying some flowers into some garland and selling it in the town. What is happening to supply of this flower garlands in the town because of this infrastructure? So, you can see that infrastructure is increasing supply in the town or not. Imagine in this village they will create cottage industries, they will make maybe produce milk or produce papad or whatever candle making factory. They will bring all these things to the town and sell it. So that means because we are building this infrastructure on one side demand is increasing. We are building of, the act of building of infrastructure itself is increasing demand. And also because imagine all these cottage industries whatever they are going to set up now because they can easily sell in this market, they are going to earn more money or not. If they are going to earn more money, what, what happens to demand in this village? It will also increase. Demand is going to increase and supply is going to increase. When both demand and supply increase that is what we call as economic activity. A market is created and more economic activity is created, production is created. Infrastructure creates production and long after it has been built it will continue to create production. That means there is an estimate earlier long ago planning commission had estimated that 1 rupee invested into infrastructure probably gives over the next many decades 15 rupees back to the economy because that much of extra production will happen in the economy. You understood this. So that means infrastructure fund is added to the category 1 because of this reason because it is creating positive impact on economy. It is probably creating positive impact on society also because now people in this village they can access better schools, colleges, universities, they can access better healthcare facilities, it is creating positive impact on you can say society. So that is why it is in category 1. Category 2 is where we do not know exactly what will be the impact, we do not know where the money is going to be invested, that means where the money is going to be spent. We know that the money is pulled together in an AIF, alternative investment fund and somewhere it is invested, we do not know exactly where. Private equity is one example where we do not know where it is being invested. <coughs> so <coughs> private equity means you might have seen shark tank where somebody buys a share of the company, they are just buying 10% of the company for maybe you know 1 crore or something that means basically they are buying, private means an individual is buying shares of a company in exchange for a certain price. This is what is private equity. We do not know what the company is doing, we do not know you can say whether it will create positive impact, negative impact, all these things. Private equity can happen when an individual buys it also or 
lot of people can pull together money and AIF can be created and from this AIF we can use this money to buy private equity in various companies. That is the meaning of private equity. Here we are not yet sure whether it will create positive impact, negative impact that is why it is put in category 2. Debt fund means you can know fund wherever you see the word fund it means money has been pulled together. Debt means what? Loan. loan. So that means money has been pulled together and it is used to give loan. That is what we call as debt fund. That means bonds are bought with this money. Fund of funds means they will invest in a different fund. That means fund of funds means money has been pulled together from many people like this and this money will be invested in other funds. They are not directly investing anywhere. This fund imagine one is venture capital fund, one is angel fund, one may be some other infrastructure fund is different. But this fund is not investing directly in any infrastructure also startup also nothing. They are investing only in an existing fund. I mean all the existing funds. This is what we call as fund of funds. <coughs> These are all category 2. In category 3 <coughs> hedge fund is also a pooled fund. It acts like a mutual fund but hedge funds are notorious for you can say creating some negative impact on economy society. Hedge funds means it is similar to a mutual fund where money is pulled together from many, pe many people. But usually high net worth individuals across the world they are investing here. HNIs, high net worth means probably this person is having minimum a thousand crores you can say net worth. Only those people are eligible to invest. Minimum investment is hundred crores into this particular hedge fund. Something like this will be present. So then what happens? Hedge fund becomes very big. They have 50,000 crores, 1 lakh crores or something. The amount of money that they have is huge. So because they have so much money, they can easily have some, you can say, pressure pull in any other country. If they go to a, imagine hedge fund, it was in news for funding some textile factories in Bangladesh which use child labor because they are making able to make more profits because they can give less money to children. And similarly, they are by selling arms when South Sudan and North Sudan were fighting, they were, you can say, funding the arms factories which were supplying arms to both South Sudan and North Sudan. Ultimately, what is important for them is making profit, doesn't matter how, what kind of impact it will create on economy, on society, etc. So that means hedge fund has been identified to sometimes, you can say, across the world. We are skeptical or we are somewhat, you can say, uh, circumspect, that means we will be careful about hedge fund. So we will have some rigid regulations, will not give any incentives to hedge funds. So that is why it is put in category 3. That means here, investment is aimed at short term returns achieved by employing complex trading, trading strategies. Sometimes even they don't violate any laws, but they violate ethics. This is what we have observed in other countries when hedge funds go there. So this is hedge fund. Pipe fund is a slightly complex knot. It is outside, you can say, purview of UPSC. So that part you don't have to worry about. Category 1, 2, 1, 3, you can say this part, if you understand the classification of what is category 1, 2, 3 and also what is the meaning of AIF, using this you will be able to answer question if there is any question in Philips. Everybody understood what is the meaning of AIF? So AIF means SEBI usually regulates, you can say all these mutual funds and SEBI had created different rules for different mutual funds whenever they kept on creating new, new mutual funds in 19, they started creating extra rules. but after a point, too many new type of mutual funds were being created. So they created one miscellaneous category of rules for all the new mutual funds that will be done. So that was called as AIF. So since then, if a new fund is created, new type of asset management company, AIF, something is created, first they will check whether it will fall into the other old rules. If it is not falling into any other old rules that SEBI has created, it will come into this category of AIF. But because SEBI's rules are right now old that means probably 96 97 was the last extra other rules they made since then lot of innovation has happened because of this reason aifs are dominating currently compared to any other type of funds you understood this this is the meaning of alternative investment fund so <coughs> sir yeah which rules are they exactly subject to the AIFs? aifs are subject to aif rules we just here is mentioned you can see there is a separate AIF rules. AIF does not include funds covered under any other rules. So they have created a separate AIF rule for this itself. And in fact they are called AIF because they are falling under this AIF rules, alternative investment fund rules. So that is why the name AIF comes from, our, you can say SEBI has categorized this as alternative to existing rules, whatever are there, they are not falling under any other rules. That is why it is called as alternative. So, so far 
we saw what is AMC and AIF and we also saw what is this um, basically the third category that means Sunil Mehta panels recommendation the third category is more than 500 crore loans whatever we just saw project Shashak how will they do it as of now there is ARC, ARC is unable to buy from the bank this loan because this loan is maybe more than 500 crore imagine a 1000 crore loan they are unable to buy it because they are unable to buy it so they need some funding to get some funding we will create AIF who will do it AMCs will usually create this AIF how will they get funding people will pool together money and they will give it to AMC AMC will give it to that AIF which will invest in ARC ARC will buy this loan ARC everybody knows we have discussed asset reconstruction company they will buy this loan they will try to recover it if they cannot recover it then what will they do they will convert it into equity or they will liquidate the company this part we have already seen so it is a slightly complex type of mechanism they have created but the advantage of this mechanism is imagine the best case scenario this is a thousand crore loan ARC did not have the money to buy it right now we have found, somehow found this entire mechanism is to fund this you can say exercise of buying this loan right now it is possible to buy this loan once the loan is bought imagine it is recovered usually this loan is bought at a haircut haircut means what it is discount price that means 1000 crore loan is brought at maybe 500 crore imagine if they recover it they will make another 500 crore profit this profit is given to these investors also whoever has invested in AIF imagine 25,000 people are there this 500 crores is divided as profit among all of them imagine they make a loss of this entire 500 crores whatever they bought they could not recover anything then they make a 500 crore loss but that loss is divided among so many 25,000 people that it is not a significant loss to anybody you understood so that means we have spread out this risk so thin that it is no longer a serious risk that is the advantage of having this sort of a mechanism of ARC and AMC you understood this so this is the mechanism we are using <coughs> in this loans above 500 crore panel recommended independent AMC supported by institutional funding through AIF this is what we just discussed <coughs> so the prop this part whatever solution we just discussed is present here what is the negative of this lack of clarity on funding means will anybody actually be interested to invest in that sort of AIF where you can say it is risky type of business that is one problem then the negotiation that happens we saw that earlier ARCs are buying it from banks this NPS from banks when they are negotiating they are trying to buy it at a haircut and this haircut they are what they are trying to demand is 80 percent lower valuation for a thousand crore loan they are trying to buy it at 200 crores but ARC is they are asking for 200 crores and bank is not willing to sell it at 200 crore it is saying minimum is 400 crores only if we do we will not sell it below below that you can say 400 if 1000 crore loan is sold at 200 crores it is not more like a shaving of the head rather than you can say haircut so because they are making entire almost entire money as a loss so this is one more problem then so far we have not been able to you can say get foreign funding from abroad because they are not yet confident on about this entire process because it is new we have not been able to get enough interest from foreign funds so this is basically negative aspect of this whole thing <coughs> earlier in 2016-2015-16 there was a proposal that we have to set up a bad bank earlier if you remember we discussed about twin balance sheet syndrome anybody remembers what is this twin balance sheet syndrome balance sheet of banks and balance sheet of corporates both have gone bad banks are unable to lend co to corporates and corporates are unable to pay back money to banks this is called as twin balance sheet syndrome so to resolve this twin balance sheet syndrome we tried a lot of things but none of them worked because consistently there was again and again some or the other type of recession was happening in the economy so NPS kept on accumulating in the bank and whatever we did it was not possible to resolve this and at this point we realized that something extraordinary needs to be done and a proposal was to set up a bad bank bad bank means what exactly will the bad bank do this bad bank will buy all the bad loans of all the banks in the country you can think of that as maybe majority of the bank bad loans of the majority of the banks 80 percent imagine all the NPS are actually bought by the bad bank bad bank will be maybe like a government bank or something if one bank will buy all these loans then what happens to the balance sheet of all the banks in the country it will improve it will not be you can say as worse as it is before once banks balance sheets are better will they be able to give new loans to corporates or not and now if corporates are able to get new loans will their problems get resolved or not 
that means we can resolve this twin balance sheet syndrome using a bank bank this was the proposal but this proposal when it came in 2016 they felt that it is not good you know right now there is no necessity just now we have implemented we had implemented insolvency bankruptcy code and we were also trying to improve how functioning of ARCs and everything. We felt it is too risky. Raghuram Rajan disagreed to this entire thing. He said it is not going to solve our problems because what happens by in, imagine you are the owner of the bank. What will you feel if you feel imagine best case scenario if I give a risky loan, the loan will come back and I will earn high interest. Worst case scenario if the loan does not come back, what is what is the option available to this person? <coughs> he can sell it to the bad bank. This type of a situation in economy is called as moral hazard. Moral hazard means wherever if there is a benefit, the benefit comes to me. And if there is a loss, the loss goes to someone else. This situation is called as moral hazard. And because this moral hazard is going to be created, Raghuram Rajan said in India actually bad bank will create more NPS rather than resolving the problem of NPS. Because every bank will try to give risky loans. Because best case scenario, they will get back the loan. And risky loans usually high risk means high returns. They will give it at a high interest rate. And worst case scenario, they can anyway sell it to the bad bank. You understood? So at that time, it was not done. But after 2020, we had COVID. And COVID created another serious blow to the economy. And at this point, we had no other choice. So we set up a bad bank after 2021. So this bad bank, its name is NARCL. Bad bank, how will it get enough money to be able to buy all these bad loans? We have used the exact same mechanism that we just discussed. We will create AIMC and AMC will create AIFs and from this AM, a, all the people pulling together money, money will come to AMC and AF and then into this NARCL. NARCL itself is an ARC but it is a government national ARC limited. So that in the name itself you can see that they have exactly used the same mechanism in Project Shashak whatever they just discussed. So that means they are going to get funding from the market as much as possible by pulling together money from people and using this money they are going to buy NPS of all the bad banks as much as possible. NPS when they set up this bad bank used to be 9% in India. Now they have reduced it to 5%. That means 4% of the NPS of the entire country of every single bank have already been bought by NARCL. You understood? It is not limited to public sector banks. This is set up by public sector. That means this is set up by government. But there is no need for it to limit to public sector bank. For them, if they have to be able to resolve this twin balance sheet syndrome, they have to reduce NPS everywhere. Not there is, no, I mean, it is not just public sector banks. <coughs> you understood? You understood the solution that we are going to try. I mean, we are try as of now implementing with regard to bad loans. This NARCL itself is the bad bank, and to get funding for this NARCL, we have set up an AMC also ca called as IDRCL. This IDRCL will create AIFs. And in this AIF, some AIFs will invest this money into ARCs. And ARCs, I mean this ARC here itself is NARCL. And this NARCL will buy bad loans from banks. And it will try to resolve it just like a normal ARC will do it. This NARCL will also do the same thing. You understood this? So, uh, when you create AIFs, that means it will create some kind of a mutual fund, right? In which money will be pulled Correct. by... Yes, it is possible that if you are investing in some mutual fund, you have to be able to understand where, where the money is being invested. They are usually transparent. In their website, they would have mentioned exactly where the money is going. There is no opaqueness in any AMC or mutual fund. If you want, don't want to invest there, then you can see where they are investing and you can avoid investing there. And also, they will not invest in high-risk funds and take money. Sometimes if you are taking medium risk, maybe 5% of your money is invested. High risk, 10% of your money is invested there. So that means people who are taking low risk, 1% of their money only goes to ARC. So that means basically they will you know, diversify the risk by spreading it out into various different things and not just on this NARCL. You understood this? <coughs> so, yeah. Uh, yes, there is a possibility here. In fact, imagine this bad bank does not is not able to recover something this NPA back. 
then who will pay for this NPA? Sir, what happens? It would not make much sense for the bad banks to buy private banking, right now. In this bad bank, what is its final goal? Is it is it to make profit? Bad bank's objective is not to make profit here, right? If it is an ARC, it is to make profit. But the NARCL's objective is to resolve the twin balance sheet syndrome. And for that, it is even willing to take a loss there also. And that means, you can say people are finally, taxpayers will have to pay for it. Yeah, exactly. That is what I am saying. Yeah, because tax I am investing in a mutual fund. And if that is invested in this NARCL, and NARCL is not enabled to you know, recover the money, then in turn, I am paying for that loss. Yes, taxpayers will be paying for that loss. So the possibility is only twofold here. One possibility is we will recover the loan, it is good for the economy. I mean, if we do not recover the loan, it is, you can say, because bad bank is there, a bad bank will be able to, you can say, somehow resolve the situation, but it is bad for society because finally people, taxpayers will actually have to pay for it. That is the problem with bad bank. In fact, every situation where government tries to interfere into economy and tries to save the banks or something bailout or something happens. It is always the taxpayers who will actually finally pay for it. <coughs> when government is doing something, it means taxpayers are doing it. <coughs> so this is basically how bad bank is working currently. Like I said, this part, whatever we just discussed is slightly complex. And if you have studied already, then only you will be able to understand it. Because at the kind of speed that we are going, it is not possible for you if you are studying it for the first time to understand it. In that sense, economy is slightly different from other subjects. It is somewhat logical and you should have built the logic earlier. Then only at this point it will be poor. If you have not, if you are not able to understand this, then personally what I would suggest is it is better to focus on basics right now. It won't help you if you are attending APEC class. If you are not able to understand, I mean whatever we are discussing is slightly advanced apart from basics. Because if you, I am assuming, my job here, whenever I sent here is same. That means my assumption is you already know the basics and we are just going for revision and extra current affairs, economic survey, budget. You understood this. <coughs> so, just give me one minute. Okay, coming to NS Vishwanathan panel, with regard to urban cooperative banks, NS Vishwanathan panel has given some recommendations <coughs> for regulation of these cooperative banks, they have, you can say, created a four-tier structure. Four-tier means we will classify the existing urban cooperative banks into four tiers. Everybody knows probably now how cooperative works. We have already seen how a company works. There are shareholders, there are board of directors, there is management, that is CEO. In a cooperative, basically what happens is, whoever usually employees will be employed by a company. They are different from shareholders, board of directors, CEO, anyone. Probably only management is also employee here, but otherwise everybody else is different. But in cooperative, employees themselves are shareholders. Consider Amul as a cooperative. Imagine it is not a cooperative, it is a normal dairy where it is a company. If it is a company, all the dairy farmers, whoever are selling milk, they will get the, you can say, price for the milk and that is the end of that relationship. Who will make profit out of this milk? They make it into milk powder, Mysore Park and they will sell it. And whatever profits are there, whoever the shareholders of this company, they will get the profit. But in a cooperative, the shareholders themselves are the milk farmers who are producing this milk. That means first time they will get the payment for the milk. Then at the end of the year, they will get a share of the profit of Amul also. That means they are getting two sources of income. One for being a shareholder, another for being either an employee or a partner or some seller or supplier or something. So that means you can see this is how cooperatives work. You understood the meaning of a co-op. In cooperative also there are shareholders, all the people who are, are there, you can say all the milk farmers themselves are shareholders. They will elect a board of directors and then there is a, you can say, CEO. If government has set up this cooperative, sometimes government itself will select the board and CEO. Otherwise, if people have come together and set up then people themselves can elect this board and CEO. <coughs> now, what is a cooperative bank? Cooperative bank is also similar. In a normal bank, the shareholders are different from depositors and lenders. I mean, depositors and people who are borrowing loans. But in a cooperative bank, people who are depositing, 
and people who are taking loans, they should be first shareholders. That means they should have contributed something to capital, then only they are allowed to actually deposit money or take a loan from the bank. That is what we call as a cooperative bank. That means imagine you go to any cooperative bank, if you say I want a loan or I want to open an account, then in the formalities of doing this process, they will also ask you to buy at least one share of this cooperative. Because without being a shareholder of the cooperative, it is not possible to do it. You understood this? So this is how cooperative bank works. With regard to urban cooperative banks, there is news right now. And in this news, you can see there is four tier cooperative banks that they are setting up. And I mean, already whatever are setting up, they can set up, they have just classifying it into four tiers. Tier 1 is up to 100 crores, tier 2 is 100 to 1000 and 1000 to 10,000 is tier 3. More than 10,000 crore deposits, if I mean these are all deposits, more than 10,000 crore if there are deposits in that urban cooperative bank, we will consider it as four tier. CRAR regulations by RBI are usually given. This part is in Basel norms. After this, we will discuss about Basel norms. CRAR means capital to risk weighted assets ratio. This is actually a minimum capital requirement. Probably everybody, has anybody studied Basel norms? What is the meaning of CAR? Capital adequacy, capital adequacy ratio. Capital adequacy is ratio is measured by capital to risk weighted assets ratio. Both are same. RBI has mandated 9% for normal scheduled commercial banks, but if here in a tier, a tier 1 you can say urban cooperative bank it is 9%, between tier 2 to tier 4 we have kept 12% capital adequacy ratio necessity, that means they have to keep 12% capital. So what exactly is this capital adequacy ratio, we will discuss it after this in base announce. <coughs> Minimum net worth required is 2 crore for tier 1 and 5 crore for others. Minimum net worth means if they have to set up a cooperative bank, they need to have this much, you can say 2 crores and 5 crores as net worth, then only they can become promoters and they can set up this particular bank. So this is basically the new regulations given by NS Vishwanathan panel for urban cooperative banks. <coughs> Next is Basel requirements. Basel is a place in Switzerland. In 1974, a big German bank failed, similar to the recent Silicon Valley bank failure, it failed. When a bank fails, you can by now expect what happens during a bank failure. As bank fails, it is unable to pay back money to depositors. Depositors' trust on the banking system is lost. At this point, when imagine another bank had given a loan to this bank, then what happens to that bank? That bank also probably will fail because it now has lost money. So this was a very large bank and in Europe, many banks had given loans to this bank. And this bank, when it failed, it led to the risk spreading to lot of other countries like France, Belgium, you can say even in Germany, many other banks. So this spread of risk, we realized that there is a risk to lot of other banks and other countries if when, whenever banks fail. And we have to do something to prevent this spread of risk. The spread of risk was almost as if an epidemic is happening between banks. That means when one bank fails, all the other bank, just like when one person gets a virus, maybe COVID or something, a lot of other people are getting it. So that means, is there a way to prevent it? Yes, like how we prevent COVID, maybe social distancing and mask and something. If we can create some rules for these banks in such a way that we can prevent the spread of risk from one bank to another. So this was basically the discussion that happened in Basel, in Switzerland. And finally, they came to a conclusion that we have to create some norms for that every bank to follow them. So that this risk will not spread from one country to another country. Initially, it was G10 countries and Spain and Luxembourg. After that, India is also now part of this, lot of other countries have joined. Basel Committee on Banking Supervision was created and they started creating these rules. First they created Basel 1 norms, but because banks will keep on changing over time, they needed Basel 2 and 3 also. Basel 1 was after Herstadt Bank in 1974 failed. They took some time before they created the first set of norms because it was the first time they are doing. And in 1998, there was East Asian crisis. East Asian crisis, when it happened, we realized that Basel 1 is not enough. We need some extra norms. And that is why we created Basel 2 by 2004. And Basel 3 2008, probably everybody knows, Lehman Brothers crisis or US housing crisis happened in 2008. We realized that this US housing crisis showed us that Basel 2 is not enough. So we added extra things and we made Basel 3. <coughs> so in India, they are initially they were applicable only automatically on all multinational banks because if multinational bank is present, they are actually, you can say, operating in multiple countries. If it fails in one country, it will have automatic effect on other countries. So India, in India, domestic banks which did not have exposure to outside, outside the country, they were not, you know, adopting this Basel norms first initially. 
But later RBI said they should also implement it. They gave a little more time to domestic banks, but they implemented it. Right now we have all implemented Basel 2 already and we are in the process of implementation of Basel 3. That means Basel 3 requires a lot of things to be done. Half of them probably we have done. The other half we are still in the progress. You can say it is in still in work in progress. We are implementing Basel 3. Currently banks are complying already with Basel 2 and they are not yet completely 100% compliant with Basel 3. <coughs> you understood so far? So, <coughs> what are these Basel norms? There are three norms in Basel. One is minimum capital requirement. Then second is supervisory review. Third is market discipline. In this last second, these two are very simple. Market discipline means every bank should display, you can say, some variables. What is the level of NPS in the bank? What are the total assets of bank, liabilities of bank, etc. These need to be displayed on their website and they will be published in newspaper, etc. This is called as market discipline. So, disclosure norms means, disclosure means what? Releasing information to the public is disclosure. When they disclose this, what is the advantage? People will know, imagine RBA will know or people will know that if there is some problem in the bank, before the problem becomes big, we can take action and we can, you can say, prevent the failure of the bank. That is the objective of, you can say, this disclosure norms. Then supervisory review. Everybody by now knows what is supervision. Just like RBA will do, you can say, inspection of banks. Basel Committee on Banking Supervision will do inspection in every country to make sure whether all the countries are still, you can say, following this Basel norms or not. Then, First is minimum capital requirement. This part we have to understand it is conceptual. Minimum capital requirement is measured by capital adequacy ratio. We already discussed what is the meaning of capital. People deposit money, this is depositors money. What is capital then? Shareholders, Shareholders money is called capital, correct. Shareholders money means banks own money. Shareholders would have given money. We already saw land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship, capital is investment coming from shareholders. That is shareholders money. What can shareholders money be used for? It can be used for operational expenses of the bank and expansion of business of the bank. What can depositors money be used for? It can be used to give loans. So that means you can see that they are these two are entirely different. But capital adequacy ratio, what it is doing is establishing a relationship between these two. Relationship means if you have one rupee of capital, how much loans can you give? This is what capital adequacy ratio shows. That means, imagine you want to give 100 rupee loan, then as of now RBI is saying 9% capital adequacy ratio, it means you should have rupees of your own money. That means capital. This is what capital adequacy ratio is. If you want to give 10,000 crore loan, it means you need to have 900 crores of your own capital. If you need to give 1,000 crore loan, that means you need to have 90 crores of your own capital. This is what it means when we say capital adequacy ratio. Adequacy means do you have adequate capital to give this much loan? You understood this? So, this is actually what is capital adequacy ratio. Our actually what Basel norms has asked to do is 8 percent, but RBI felt we need to keep extra, little extra in India. That is RBI has declared it to be 9 percent. So, we have to keep 9 rupees to give 100 rupee loan in India. You understood this. So, to make it simple, let us assume if we keep 10 rupees, then we have, can give 100 rupees loan. That means if it is 10 percent, capital adequacy ratio is 10 percent, then this is how it will work. What is the importance of having this bank capital? You already know by now, if you have bank capital, when the loan becomes NPA, then what do we do? We will use our bank capital to make sure that we will convert it into depositors' money, get pay back the depositor. So, this is how you can say we are paying the money back to the depositor. Absorbing unanticipated losses and preserve the confidence in the financial institution. This is what we are trying to do by paying back depositors. Protecting uninsured depositors. Usually, there is an insurance for all the depositors. In India also it is there, in other countries also it is there. In India, there is a DICGC. You might have studied DICGC is Deposit Insurance and Credit Guarantee Corporation of India. They will give insurance whenever a bank fails and you are not able to get your money back. Up to 5 lakh rupees, they will give your insurance. Imagine your total deposit is 3 lakh, you will get full 3 lakhs back. If your total deposit is 10 lakh, then how much will you get? 5 lakh. They will give only up to 5 lakh. They will not give more than that. Why? How did they choose this 5 lakh? We saw how many accounts actually have more than 5 lakh in India. 
it was approximately 6 to 7 percent accounts only. That means 93 percent people are going to be protected if we give 5 lakh rupee insurance. We felt that this is enough because the remaining 7 percent are capable of taking care of themselves, maybe buying insurance by themselves. Right now, this up to 5 lakh, no need to buy insurance by people. People don't need to buy insurance. Government will buy. Government will pay the premium to DICGC and it has insured all the depositors. You understood? What does it mean to you? If you have a bank account, if you have deposited money in that bank account, if the bank fails, then government will give you insurance, how much ever you have deposited. If it is below 5 lakh, you will get full amount. If it is more than 5 lakh, you will get up to 5 lakh. So, if you have more than 5 lakh, it is better to open another bank account and split it into two parts. <coughs> so, split it into as many parts as possible, which is lesser than 5 lakh. So, that you will get full amount, even worst case scenario when a bank fails. You understood this. But some people who, are not, who have not insured their deposits, if the bank fails, they will lose their money. That means if they don't, if the bank does not have enough capital and it fails, then uninsured depositors will lose their money. That is a second problem. So to, to avoid this problem, we need to have enough capital. Then, providing financial institution owners against increase in insurance premium. Everybody knows how insurance works. What is the meaning of insurance? <coughs> insurance, we are, we are being protected against some sort of an adverse consequence. Insurance in simple economic terms, it is a bet. Bet that, imagine you are buying life insurance. It means you are, you are betting that you are going to die in the next one year. Insurance company is betting you are not going to die in the next one year. You pay, imagine you pay 15,000 insurance. It means you are saying if I die, then you pay some 1 crore to my family. And they are saying you will not die, so I will take your 15,000. And if you don't die, I will not pay anything. That means you will lose that entire 15,000. This is exactly the meaning of insurance. And insurance is same everywhere, it is a bet. You buy car insurance, it means you are betting that there will be an accident in the next one year. They are betting there will be no accident. How will they bet that there will be no accident or you will not die? How will they know it? They will know it based on data, statistics. They will look at your age, you are in 20s. And there is very likely, you know, less likelihood that you will die in your 20s. So, how many people actually die in their 20s if they see probably out of 1 crore, maybe 1 or 2 will die? Or you can say, I don't know exactly the number, I'm just giving an example. In this case, so then they will realize that if 1 crore people buy insurance, only 1 or, people, one or 2 people die, then they will, will make a lot of profit. So, they, are, they have even reduced the amount of premium that you have to pay in 20s and 30s. As you go into 40s, premium will increase because the risk that probably people will die will slowly keep increasing. 50s, it is even more. 60s, 70s, even more. 80s, they will stop selling insurance at that point. <laughs> Okay, that is different. IPO, if okay, that I will explain. to the insurance sector, so do they take care of it as well? LIC is buying it. It may have been given. The company is offering, but it is not selling in the market. So okay, that is that is not actually done by insurance sector. Government will force LIC to do it sometimes. That part we will see later. But overall, the meaning of insurance is only this much. Right now, imagine you are the owner of the bank and you want to buy insurance on this bank. If you have to pay, pay, okay, how does insurance company decide the premium that you have to pay for anything? For life insurance, for car insurance or something, how will they decide? Based on the risk that is associated with your death, they will decide how much premium you have to pay. Risk that is associated with probable car accident, they will decide. So that means you can see that based on the risk that is, uh, you can say, present in failure of this bank, they will decide how much premium you have to pay. If you have less you can say capital in the bank, risk is high or low? High. Risk is high. That what happens to premium? High. Premium will increase if you can say the amount of risk keeps increasing and amount of risk keeps increasing if capital is low. So that means you can see if you have enough bank capital, it protects the financial institutions owners against increase in insurance premiums. Means because we have reduced the risk in the bank, you can buy insurance at a lower premium now. You understood. Imagine you want to buy health insurance. There are some health insurance actually if you go to the gym every day, 300 days in 365 days, they will reduce your premium amount by 20%. Because you are taking care of your health which is good for them. They don't need to pay insurance. You understood. Same way here, if the bank is keeping proper capital, then they will reduce the premium that you can say that bank needs to pay. So this is how insurance you can say works. <coughs> this is one more reason why they need to keep adequate bank capital. Acquiring real investments, real sector we already saw, real investment means 
buying land, buying a building, buying software, buying computers, etc. so that they can expand their business. For that, which money can they use? They can use capital of the bank. This is why you can say capital is, these are all the reasons why bank's capital is important. Now, capital adequacy ratio is a measure of bank financial strength to ensure the banks have enough cushions to absorb losses. That means whenever there are NPS, before it makes severe losses, how much absorb, how much cushion is present? That is what bank capital is doing. Before becoming insolvent, losing depositors funds. Insolvent means not being able to pay back to whoever has given them money. That is insolvency. So CAR is, as of now, like I said, 9%. CAR is measured by this formula. Tier 1 plus Tier 2 capital divided by risk weighted assets into 100. So this capital so far we have discussed as one unit, but capital can be divided into tier 1 and tier 2 capital. Tier 1 is permanent capital, tier 2 is temporary capital. Permanent capital means here I have given shareholders money is permanent capital. Imagine you buy shares of a company, this money is permanently of the company. They will never give you back that money. If you want, you, if you want to get the money, you can sell the shares to someone else in the market. You understood. Imagine for example, you buy a car from car factory, Hyundai. And at this point, you bought the car. After using it for one year, you feel bored with the car. Can you sell it back to the company? They will not buy it because they are not in the business of buying cars. They are in the business of manufacturing cars. You understood? But still, if you need money, what can you do? You can sell it in second hand market. Exactly the same thing will happen with shares. Once you buy shares from a company, it means that you are you're permanently given money to the company. They have no obligation to give it to you back. But if you need money, you can sell it to someone else in second hand market, these shares. In Bombay Stock Exchange, National Stock Exchange, whatever you sell, this is secondary market. That means it is similar to second hand market. You understood? Because the company has no obligation to give back this rupee to you. This is permanently capital of the company. And similarly here, we are talking about the company as a bank. This is the permanently the capital of a bank. That is what we call as permanent capital. By now you can understand probably what is the meaning of temporary capital. If the bank has taken a loan from someone, then eventually they have to pay back at some point or not. Then this is called as temporary capital. In case of buyback, buyback, buyback. buyback of shares means if they want to buy the shares, only then they can, if the, if the car company wants to buy the cars back, then they can buy it back. There is no obligation on them to buy, but if they want to buy, then they can buy it. They will do it sometimes, but it is a rare phenomenon. Usually, if they only if they want to do it, they can do it. Is it legalized or not? It is legal. It is because if a buy and sell relationship, both have to agree, right? When both agree, then only it will happen. There is no obligation on the bank to buy back shares. There is no obligation on any company. If they want to do it, and somebody wants to sell it, then only they will sell it. If they don't want to sell it, then they cannot buy it back also. You understood? <coughs> Tier 2 is missing here, you can write Tier 2 is temporary capital, mostly loans taken by the bank. So this is meaning of Tier 1 and Tier 2 capital. Tier 1, Tier 2 capital, if you add up both. <coughs> Basically, RBI has said 7% of this 9% should be Tier 1 capital, 2% of this 9% should be Tier 2 capital and divided by risk weighted assets. What are assets of a bank? Assets of a bank are loans. Assets everybody knows. Risk weighted means if the bank is giving loans, we have to classify it based on risk, high risk, medium risk, low risk. So whenever we classify it based on risk, sometimes we give weights and those weights also are added here. You can say that is risk weighted assets. Why we add weights is you can say slightly it is somewhat mathematical in concept. As of now, in I, earlier in class I had explained it. As of now in upper class, this our mathematics part, we'll skip it. Right now you can just look at it as, you can say, <coughs> tier 1 plus tier 2 capital divided by risk weighted assets. Risk weights are given because all loans are not same. Some are high risk, some are low risk, some are medium risk. We have considered even risk weight also. If you multiply 100, in simple mechanism if you look at it, if you have total tier 1 and tier 2 capital put together is 100 rupees, then how much, you already know, this, this result should come out to imagine 10 for simplicity. It should come out to 9 actually, that means 9% is what RBI has said. Imagine it is 10%. If you have 100 rupees, it should come out to 10%, then how much loan can you give here? This, this, is, a, this is a simple CSAT type of calculation. If it should come out to 10, then this should be how much? This should be 1000. 
this 0 and 0 is cancelled and 100 by 100 is not. So that means you can see that basically if you have 100 rupees then you can give 1000 rupees loan. If you have 100 crores then you can give 1000 crores loan. The CAR formula will tell us because RBI has already fixed this 9%, 10%. Only choice we have is, we already have a limit on how much actually capital we have been able to raise from shareholders. Now, how much loans we can give based on this capital is fixed based on how much you can, uh, you know, this formula. Imagine we have already raised 100 crores of money from shareholders. RBI has fixed this to be 10%. Then we can only give 1000 crore loan. Imagine we want to give 10,000 crore loan, then what should we do? Increase this. Increase whatever capital we have to 1000 crores, then we can give to 10,000 crores. So that means you can see this is how this capital adequacy ratio is working. You understood this. <coughs> so <coughs> somebody has asked what are the mechanisms of AMC, how AMC will collect money from people. AMC collects money from people when people are investing in the AMC. AMC is working like a mutual fund. Mutual fund means yesterday I explained to you what it is. It will just pull together money from multiple people, take this money, invest somewhere. If they make a profit, they will take a commission and give you the remaining profit. This is how mutual funds and AMCs work. <coughs> between Basel 2 to Basel 3, they did not create any third pillar. Only three pillars are there between Basel 2 to Basel 3, both. They just enhanced, you can say, minimum capital requirement, 8% was whatever was there, 9% here. So similarly, supervisory review also. Supervision used to happen once in six months, maybe now once in a quarter or something. Enhanced risk disclosure. <coughs> Earlier they were disclosing less number of variables, now they are disclosing more. So that means you can see that the number of, uh, you can say, pillars have not increased. Each pillar they have tried to strengthen it. That means they are trying to do the same thing, but in a much more vigorous manner to be able to prevent any bank failure. Where the risk is exactly arising from, how you can say we can identify here high risk, medium risk, low risk type of a loan. Risk is coming from three factors. You can say one is market risk. Market risk means imagine the deposit, I mean borrower has taken a loan. This person has no intention to cheat the bank. He has invested in his business. Once he made some product, this product imagine because of market factors, imagine there is COVID or something, nobody is buying this product. And whose mistake is this? It is nobody's mistake because it is because of COVID it is happening. It is not the mistake of the bank. It is not the mistake of the borrower. It is not the mistake of the consumer. It is nobody's mistake. This is what we call as market risk. Credit risk. Imagine this borrower takes a loan and later even though he has the money, he does not pay it back. Willful default. You might have studied. Willful defaulter means willfully this person is not paying back even though he has the money. Then whose mistake is it? It is the borrower's mistake and that is what we call as credit risk. <coughs> then operational risk. Imagine bank is not following the processes and procedures properly. Even though they probably actually could have found out that this person will not be able to pay back the loan, still they gave the loan. Maybe because of political pressure or maybe because people were not attentive enough to look at all the details properly. Then that means operations within the bank have failed and they have given loan to someone which, where they should not have given the loan. Then whose mistake is it? It is the bank's mistake. That is what we call as operational risk. There are three types of risk. One is the bank has done the mistake. Second, the borrower has done the mistake. Third, it is nobody's mistake. It is some, you can say, external factor that happened in the economy which led to this loss and which led to loan becoming NPA. You understood this? <coughs> These are the three types of risks that we are considering majorly. So, <coughs> Next coming to capital conservation buffer. We already know that every bank now has to hold capital. How much capital adequacy ratio should be there? 9%. Earlier if you remember I told you that we have to keep SLR 18% but banks will keep a little more extra because to prevent that situation of MSF. We saw that if we keep exactly 18% then they will not be able to have enough money to pledge it with RBI. So they will usually keep 20-21% etc. Similarly here, if they are keeping exactly 9%, sometimes imagine somebody is asking for a loan, they will not be able to give this loan because they don't have enough capital kept to be able to give that loan. We saw, if they have to be able to give this loan, imagine they already have uh, 90 crores, maximum loan they can give is only 1000, already 1000 crore they have given. Now they have an opportunity to give 100 crore loan at once, but they are unable to give it because they don't have enough capital. You understood? To prevent this scenario, apart from existing capital, 
they will keep a little extra buffer capital that is what we call as capital conservation buffer so this buffer capital is of 2.45% of tier 1 itself they will keep it in tier 1 but if they don't keep this there will be no penalty by RBI but if they keep don't keep that 9% then there will be huge penalty by RBI based on bank rate you understood this is like a buffer buffer means to prevent this 9% from eroding away we have kept a little extra that is why we call it as capital conservation buffer imagine in national park you might have seen there is core area and buffer area or something extra buffer is created so that whatever is within this core area is not going to be affected same way here this core is what we have actual capital minimum capital requirement and buffer is the extra amount that we are keeping extra 2.5 percent rbi will not have any penalty for not keeping this 2.5 percent but in this 2.5 at least half that means 1.25 you have to keep if you don't keep this much then rbi will put you on a list where it will keep observing what I mean whether it will further reduce you understood this in PCA that is prompt corrective action still there will not be any penalty if it goes below 9% then the penalty is very huge you understood this <coughs> so this is the meaning of It is also part of, yeah, it is also part of Basel norms. Same Basel norms, whatever they have suggested, we have implemented it as it is. It is also part of Basel norms. Then, domestic systematically important banks. This is also suggested by Basel norms, we have implemented it. What does it mean? Domestic systematically important means, systematic means what? If entire economy is considered as a system, then banking system is one subsystem, maybe fiscal policy system, government is one subsystem, corporate is one subsystem, etc. All these subsystems are working together to make the entire economy work. Systematically important means, imagine human body is a system. All the organs in the human body are working together to make the system work. For the entire system to work, some organs are very important, like maybe the heart. If without the heart, the human body will fail. So that means it is a systematically important organ. So that means, similarly for the economy, if we can identify some banks, which if they fail, the entire economy will fail. Those are called as systematically important banks. Domestic means within the country whatever is such a large bank that if it fails it will lead to collapse of the entire economy that is called as domestic systematically important banks. They are very big banks and we have to be more cautious with regard to these banks. If they fail entire economy will fail so we need to take extra measures with regard to these banks. <coughs> so how to identify which is domestic, domestic systematically important bank? We have taken you can say four criteria these four criteria are given by Basel 3. First is size. The size of the bank is this 40% 20, 20, 20 are weightages given. That means size is doubly important compared to the other you can say factors given here. That is the meaning of weightage. Size, how will we identify it is enough size? So size is if the loans given by this bank are affecting 2% of the GDP of the country. In the next slide I have given 2% of the, imagine SBI has given loans. Using that loans we are producing some products or buying some products. All the cost of these products, if you see what is the weight, uh, money amount, that amount is more than 2% of GDP. Then this bank is big enough to be enough size to be declared as domestic systematically important bank. You understood? Then interconnectedness, what does it mean? <coughs> Interconnected means the banks, whether they have given loans between each other, more the interconnectedness is what happens to risk? Risk increase because if one bank fails, it will lead to no spread of risk, failure of other bank. Even if size increases, what happens to risk? If a large bank fails, the risk is more than if a small bank failing. Risk will increase. Interconnectedness increases, risk increases. Complexity in operation. Earlier banks used to do only banking business. Nowadays banks are doing lot of mix up of everything. Banks are selling insurance also, which is called as bank assurance. Then banks are selling some uh, mutual fund investment schemes and such a mix up of everything. So. When banks are doing only banking, then it was easier for regulator to observe and check what is happening. Imagine umpire is checking, umpire, cricket umpire is present and he is watching whether cricket is happening or not or how it is happening. But right now in the same stadium, they are playing cricket and football and hockey at the same time. Then you can say three separate regulators are there and they have to coordinate between each other and see what exactly is happening. That means banks are doing banking also and what other SEBI will regulate, you can say mutual funds and insurance regulatory development authority of India will regulate insurance. All of it is happening at the same time. As complexity increases, the power 
possibility that one of the umpire will miss something will keep on increasing or not? Yes, three balls are all moving at the same time. That means you can see that the complexity as it increases, the risk will increase. You understood this. So this is basically complexity. Then substitutability. What does it mean? Can we substitute one bank with another bank? Imagine one bank fails. Maybe whatever the bank was doing, another bank can do the same job. Then substitutability is high. We can replace it with another bank, easily substitutable. If we cannot replace it, if the bank is so large that it is not possible to substitute it, then the substitutability is low. <coughs> you understood the meaning of substituting means it is, an, it, is for, it is doing an important function right now. If it fails to do it, we should be able to substitute it with something else. Consider for example, India has maybe one only single wicket keeper and this person goes in a BMW or something and this you know does some sort of accident or something. Then now we do not have this person is also not able to do this keeping, we do not have a substitute. Then what happens to risk in Indian team? It is going to increase some other wicket keeper is there, he is not able to catch the ball or something that means there is a risk. That means as substitutability decreases, what happens to risk? Increases. You can see that all the other when the increase risk is increasing whereas substitutability when it decreases risk is increasing. So mergers we are yeah, substitutability actually you, you can say risk will increase because of mergers that part is correct. But we are going for mergers for operational efficiency. Imagine why we are going for bank, bank mergers. Imagine earlier when SBI used to be 5 separate banks. In old Rajendra Nagar there used to be 5 separate branches. State Bank of Travancore, State Bank of Mysore, State Bank of India, everything. But now because everything is merged together, they can just have one single branch. And that means they do not need to hire 12 different people for each branch. They do not need to pay rent for each branch, electricity bill for each branch. What happens, this is only in one area. Imagine they have 20,000 you can say branches across the country. In all these branches if they are saving money will their you can say overall operational expenses reduce or not. This is one such one reason there are multiple such other reasons why you can say they are doing merger. This it is true this is also true that if you do merger substitutability will actually reduce and risk will increase that part is also true. You understood this? <coughs> yes. So you are saying trust will increase? Yeah, because yeah. Oh, yeah. the bank, so <coughs> I am more efficient now to repay, <coughs> repay back to the depositor, right? Uh, ideally, yeah, that is how we should do it. But how we have done it, we cannot say that is how we have done it so far. So, but overall, you can say as the bank becomes bigger, people feel more, you know, this bank is more trustworthy because it is a big bank. So that is also true. <coughs> RBI has so far declared three banks as, you can say, no, domestic system, all these criteria have been you can say checked and in India we found three banks SBI, ICICI, HDFC are domestic systematically important. That means they are too big to fail. We will not allow them to fail. If they fail, entire econ Indian economy will fail. So RBI will keep a close watch on them to make sure that they will never fail. Even if something slightly goes wrong in these banks, RBI will take immediate action to be make sure that they will come back to you know, good health. So that it will not create any serious negative impacts on the economy. You understood this. <coughs> so, coming to prompt corrective action, there are a set of guidelines for banks that are weak in terms of identified indicators. So, for banks, there are some indicators which tell the health of the bank. For a human being, indicator will be maybe cholesterol or blood pressure or something. Similarly, for a bank, how many NPAs are there, whether they are keeping CR or SLR properly, minimum capital requirement are they keeping properly, these are all the type of indicators. When we look at these indicators, can we tell whether the bank is healthy or not or not? We will be able to identify it or not. So this is how, just like for example a normal person before he becomes unhealthy, usually every 6 months it is recommended that we take some sort of a blood test or something, health checkup. Similarly a checkup is done for all the banks and if any banks are showing any signs of stress in one of these indicators, then we will put them under prompt corrective action. We will correct it before it becomes any more serious. It is more like a preventive mechanism to prevent any serious problems in the bank. So you can see poor asset quality, what does it mean? Asset means loan, quality of loan means they have given maybe high risk, too many high risk loans, that is quality of loan. Insufficient capital, that means they do not have minimum capital requirement is 9%, they are not keeping it properly. Insufficient profits or losses, insufficient profits or losses. 
That means they are not able to unprofit, something is wrong in their operations of the bank. So these are all indicators that some, you can, something needs to be done with regard to this bank. It is an early intervention package or a resolution guideline. That means early intervention means before the problem becomes big, we will try to resolve it. That is why it is called as early intervention package. <coughs> so when we introduced it in Jan 2018, there were 12 banks under PCA. So we realized that we have so far not been able to do these checkups and now we are doing it. And immediately once we did it, we, need, we came to know what we need to do. And immediately once we, you can say, started taking action, you can see within a few, just one year or around one year, we, will, we were able to reduce this to 12 to 5 banks. That means once PCA was created, the impact of PCA was very visible. We were able to correct whatever problems were there in these banks immediately. So this PCA framework is still there. I, you can check now once how many banks are under PCA framework. Right now they will not ask that kind of question, but if you know what exactly is this PCA framework, it is enough. <coughs> Here I have just given for your reference, you can go through this table once, just to give, you can say, confidence here. CRAR, you already know, capital to risk weighted assets ratio. We already discussed about that it should be 2.5, but RBI measures it off, that is 1.25. If it is not there, then only they will keep it under the threshold. So then we saw common equity tier 1 is tier 1 capital, everybody knows already. Common equity means there are a type of shares. There are two types of shares, preference shares and common equity. Preference shares means when a company goes to liquidation, earlier I told you there is a list of who should get the money first. Workers will get it and then creditors will get it, etc. In that list, final person who will get it is common equity holder. Before common equity holder, there is a preference given to other type of shareholders. They are called as preference shareholders because there is a preference given in liquidation. This is basically difference between preference shares and common equity. So now, in this case, you can see, <coughs> we already know about common equity. Tier 1 capital means permanent capital. How much they should hold that permanent capital is 9%. This 1.25% also is tier 1 capital. Then, apart from that, you can see net NPA. We already know what is gross NPA, net NPA. How do we calculate gross NP, net NPA from gross NPA? Gross NPA minus provisioning is net NPA. This also we saw yesterday. Return on assets. That means how much they are able to earn from these assets, whatever they have given as loans, that is called return on assets. Tier 1 leverage ratio. Leverage ratio is not usually used in India much, but to compare with other countries, we use leverage. Leverage is similar to CRAR itself. You can see ratio of tier 1 capital to total assets. We are only considering tier 1 that means permanent capital. We are only considering total assets without any risk weights. This is what we consider considered as leverage. In other countries they use this leverage to measure bank health. We don't use it. But for comparison with other countries only we use it. Just for that reason you should know what is the formula but beyond that we don't need to get into leverage ratio. <coughs> In India banks capital is measured based on what formula? CAR only, that means capital to risk weighted assets. So, <coughs> any questions so far? <coughs> Cooperative banks, can they be subjected to PCA, you are saying? So they can also be subjected to PCA, but cooperative banks usually are not primarily regulated by RBI. They are regulated by registrar of cooperative societies in the state. So they can they can take action based on this whole PCA framework they can use to take this action. Any other questions? CRAR, yes, both are same. It is, it is just the way we are, you can say, calling it is different. Sir, <coughs> yeah. So, is this statutory reserve requirement, does it mean CRR and SLR? Yes, yes. Statutory reserve requirement in that slide, whatever we saw, they are CRR, SLR. But in India, they are not variable. In other countries, they are variable depending upon the risk on the bank. But in India, they anyway, RBI has fixed them at 4% CRR or you can say 18% SLR or something. Wasn't correct. Uh, 
Okay, controlling the supply of money is correct with regard to CRR and But uh, they basically they said that statutory reserve requirement does not keep depositors money liquid and safe. That is what the answer is said. Okay, it I mean it depends upon which, which year they ask the question. <coughs> Regulations, okay. Regulations will keep changing from year to year and you know based on what the present regulations are based on that only we can you know derive what the answer is so one risk in previous year's question is especially in current affairs oriented type of subject sometimes the answer that the key they would have given at that year it is relevant for that year only it is not relevant in present day current affairs so we have to see you know how they were using so right now you can imagine if there is a question same statutory reserve requirements what is their role their role primarily is actually to ensure you can say Confidence in the banking system is maintained. Secondary role is to control money supply. So this is, you can say, present situation. <coughs> <coughs> so, coming to NBFCs. Any other questions? No questions. So NBFC is a non-banking finance company. Here the actual definition is given, this de using this definition you will not be able to understand the concept of NBFC. Majority of NBFC so far whatever you have discussed about banks, there is a slight difference between bank and NBFC. In a bank we take depositors money, but in most of the NBFCs there is no concept of deposits. In majority of NBFCs there is all capital of NBFC itself. Capital means where is it coming from? Shareholders. Shareholders. This NBFC it not only gives loan, sometimes it buys shares, some, whatever it wants other than Finance companies means they can invest in any financial instruments, but majorly they are giving loans in India. So you can think of it as similar to bank, but it will not take deposits. It will give its own money as loan. That is what is primarily NBFC. Recently, RBA has allowed some NBFCs which are big to take only time deposits. Time deposit means what? Fixed deposit, recurring deposit. These are time deposits which can only withdraw after a time. So these are called as deposit taking NBFCs, but they are relatively less in number. Most of the NBFC they are giving loans from which whose money? Their own money, shareholders. This is the concept of NBFC. Definition of NBFC is here, you can read it, but that is somewhat, you can say dry definition which will not tell you anything about NBFC. <coughs> Payments bank are niche type of banks. They are regulated by RBA, they are created by, you can say given by RBA itself. Payments bank and small bank, Nachiket more recommended that existing full-fledged scheduled commercial banks are very large and not enough people are there in India who can set up more such banks. Because of this reason, we should allow to set up a small type of banks also, which will provide only limited set of services and which will have less risk also. Payments bank means it will take money from depositors, maximum limit of deposit is only 1 lakh rupees. Beyond that, it won't take loans. I mean, it won't take deposits. And it cannot give any loans. If it cannot give any loans, how will it earn money? 75% of the money it takes as deposits, it will invest in government securities. That means it will buy government securities, which are liquid. And 25% of the money it will put as, you can say, fixed deposit in other banks. This is how payments banks are working. You understood? That means there is no risk at all in this payments bank because they are not giving any risky loans at all. Both are safe. This, you can say government security is also safe and this fixed deposit is also safe. So they have given permission for a lot of people. Supermarkets can also open this payments bank. Even this phone pay, Paytm, everybody, anybody who wants to open payments bank, they can open because the risk associated is very less. So that is why, why we want more people to open banks, payments bank. When they start opening, you can say 100,000 payment banks if they are opening across the country. All these thousand banks if they are providing services and opening accounts. Will it lead to increased financial inclusion or not? Without increasing much risk, we are creating financial inclusion. That is the objective of opening this payment bank. Small bank means it is almost same as a normal scheduled commercial bank. One major rule in a small bank is if they are giving totally whatever loans they are giving, 50% of the loans, their ticket size should be less than 25 lakh. Ticket size means the whole total amount of loan in one loan, how much they are giving, it should be less than 25 lakh. These are small loans. That is what is called a small bank. So who will it cater to primarily? <coughs> people, middle class people or you can say small scale industry, 
poorer sections of society they are the ones who are taking maximum up to 25 lakh loan normal banks are not interested to give loans to them because they are interested to give big loans because big loans means they can make bigger profits and also they don't need to do, do many operations to give big loans you understood this so this is a small bank and payments bank Cooperative banks are different. Small banks, payment banks have a different classification. Gramin banks are there. Gramin bank. So they are like, uh, they come under this uh, category. That is re regional, I think regional rural bank yes. is what you are saying. That is also a different category. RRB is different category. So the small bank, payment bank, we are calling them as, you can say, differentiated banks. So in differentiated banks, Nachiket more recommended, you can say, so far, three types of banks we have opened. One is small bank, second is payment bank, third is wholesale long term finance bank it is this part is not in news this year that is why i have not added it into discussion in normal classes i will usually i have discussed this part wholesale long term finance bank will give wholesale loans small wholesale loans means loans will be very big 100 crore few hundred crore thousand crore small bank will give loans up to 25 lakh rupees for up to 50% of loans and payments bank it will not give any loans at all it will only give i mean it will only buy government securities and fixed deposits these are all called as differentiated banks. You understood this? So, in the first statement, the company's financial assets, is it the paid up capital only or it also includes the money? Uh, <coughs> financial asset means, okay, we are coming to this 50 50 test. Who can set up this? Who can be an NBFC? If you can say two conditions need to be satisfied, first condition is imagine a company's assets means what the company owns, what will make money for this company? This asset. They 50 percent, imagine if they own 100 crores of assets totally, more than 50 crore of assets should be financial assets. What is the real asset and financial asset we have already seen? Financial asset means what? Bonds, shares, when you give money you should get back money. That sort of thing is not as financial assets. If you buy real estate, if you buy gold, if you buy a house and give it on rent, these are all real assets or physical assets. So that means more than 50 percent should be first financial assets. Then out of this 100 crore total net worth that you have, Maybe yearly you are getting maybe you know 7 crore, 8 crore or something. 8 crore is annual income that you are getting on this 100 crore. Out of this annual income, that means income from this financial asset, here also more than 50 percent of the income should be coming from financial assets. You understood? This is the second criteria. When both criteria are satisfied, 50-50 test is satisfied, then only they will give you permission to open an NBFC. That means your principal business itself is financial business because your assets are also financial, your income is also majorly financial. This is what they are trying to test here using 50-50 test. <coughs> you understood this? So, this 50-50 test is usually used to decide whether you are eligible to set up an NBFC or not. Who is regulator of NBFCs? Like banks, usually they don't have a single regulator, they have multiple regulators. In the central, you can say box here, housing finance institutions, national housing bank will regulate then venture capital fund and stock broking, all these are regulated by SEBI. Everything related to stock market, NBFCs are regulated by SEBI. Nidhi companies, mutual benefit companies, they are regulated by Ministry of Corporate Affairs. And cheat fund companies, state governments will usually pass cheat fund acts and create cheat fund registrars, etc. to regulate this cheat funds. And insurance companies by Insurance Regulatory Development of Authority of India. So NBFCs can participate in all these type of financial businesses depending upon what their actual principal business is the regulator will change. There is no single regulator for all types of NBFCs. <coughs> so this is regulation as so far about NBFCs, how it is working. Then systematically important NBFC, just like we saw domestic systematically important bank, how to identify systematically important NBFC, it is very simple. If asset size of 500 crore or more is present, then we can declare it as systematically important. Asset size means they have invested in something, maybe they have given loans of 500 crore, invested in shares of 500 crore or something. Then all these NBFCs are declared if they are more than 500 crore assets, they are all called as systematically important. So <coughs> once we identify them as systematically important, usually NBFCs take loans from actually these banks also. Imagine a loan, if they have taken a loan as big as 1000 crores and then this NBFC fails, then will it affect the banking system also or not? So that means we have to keep a watch on big NBFCs which have big asset size. So that is why systematically important NBFCs are also identified and watched. So that is why we have identified what are systematically important. Are they same as banks? There are similarities, 
may actually big similarities are present especially in India but there are differences. NBFCs can accept demand deposits. Demand deposit means what? <coughs> Current account savings account. We cannot withdraw the money whenever we want. That is what is demand deposit. NBFCs are not part of payment settlement system. Payment and settlement means imagine you have a bank account with which you can buy something on Amazon or you pay someone on phone pay. This is not possible using NBFC account. Because if it has to be possible, what type of account should it be? It should be a demand deposit. If they are, don't have demand deposit at all, they cannot be part of payment settlement system. Even if you have to write a check on your account to someone, what type of account should it be? Same demand deposit. So you cannot draw check on itself. That means you cannot write checks also with NBFC accounts. And NBFC depositors do not have deposit insurance. We just discussed about DICGC which will give 5 lakh rupee insurance. NBFCs will not get that insurance if they fail. Only banks depositors will get that insurance if the bank fails. These are the differences between banks and NBFCs. <coughs> so same thing is given here. There is uh, reserve ratios. You can see this part is the only extra thing. Reserve ratio means CRR and SLR. They are not necessary for NBFC. Why they are not necessary? Why we are keeping them in banks? Because depositor can ask their money back whenever they want. But here can they ask their money back? They don't have demand deposit at all. They cannot ask their money back. So they, it is no use of keeping them. Also, banks are participating in money multiplier effect. Whereas NBFCs are not participating in money multiplier effect. We saw that in a bank, depositor has deposited same money. Even a person who has taken loan is also has it, has it immediately. But in NBFC, the money is either NBFC's money or now this has already been given as money to someone else. So that means the money is only with one person. That means you can see that there is no money multiplier effect that is happening. You understood? Between NBFCs and banks, who will participate in money multiplier effect? Bank. Money multiplier effect process is also called as credit creation. It is just another word to say money multiplier effect. <coughs> Urban cooperative banks are regulated by RBI or state cooperative society. They are regulated by both, but primary regulator is registrar of state cooperative societies. If it is a state cooperative, in India for cooperatives, there is a two-tiered regulation. If it is within the state, it is state government regulation. If it is multiple states, it is union government regulation. In seventh schedule of, you can say, the constitution in union list, multi-state cooperatives are present. In state list, single state cooperatives are present. You understood? Any difference between tier 1 and tier 2? Tier 1 capital means permanent capital. Tier 2 capital is temporary capital. This part we already saw. That is the difference. <coughs> inflation chapter is relatively very simple. We have discussed a bit about inflation already. So we will go quickly. If you feel that I am fast, you can tell me there. I will slow it down at that point. <coughs> so. We'll take break after 10 minutes. <coughs> so what is the meaning of inflation? Everybody knows this already. Increase in general price level is inflation. So if there is actual decrease in general price level, then it is called as deflation. Decrease means 100 rupee item became 110. It is increase. It became 90 rupees. Then it is decrease. This is deflation. Disinflation means first it became 110. Then it 115 here 10 rupee increase here only 5 rupee increase still increase is happening or not increase is still happening rate of increase has reduced this is called disinflation so this is basically so what is conceptual meaning of inflation when we say general price level is increasing it also means the value of our money is reducing right now if you buy imagine using 1 crore somewhere you can buy maybe in a village maybe 1 acre land using 1 crore but if you buy it after 10 years, it is equivalent to 50 lakh only as of now. That means you can buy how many acres? Half an acre. 10 years later, you can buy only half an acre. 20 years later, you can buy a quarter an acre. That means what is happening to the money value? It is decreasing. If you keep a suitcase of cash in your house, then what is happening to that cash? Its value is actually reducing. This is the actual meaning of inflation. When we say general price level is increasing, it actually means that the value of our cash is consistently reducing. Even 
the cash looks the same even if rags have not an eat, eaten the cash also it looks the same but its value what you can buy with that cash has actually reduced over a period of time you understood this this is the actual meaning of inflation <coughs> What are the causes? There are two causes of inflation. So far in monetary policy, we have discussed only one cause that is demand pull inflation. We saw that when person has more money in his hands, then usually demand means there is, de you can say willingness and there is ability. Willingness people already have, ability was what was missing. Once you give him money, ability is also there, demand is created. And this demand was creating inflation. So far only this part we have seen. But cost push also will create inflation. Cost push means as raw material prices increase, imagine for example, raw material consider wheat price has increased even the biscuit price will increase or not <coughs> if wheat using wheat they are making some sort of a biscuit and they are selling it biscuit prices will increase because wheat price has increased it is not because increasing demand people are not demanding more biscuits but still the prices will increase or not yes this is called as cost push inflation imagine oil price increases at world level when we import that oil oil is used as raw material in everything Imagine you buy carrots in your sh vegetable shop. These carrots are not produced here. They are produced some 200 kilometers away. From there to here, they will use diesel to bring them. And that diesel price is added to the carrots. That means cost push inflation is happening in carrots also. You understood this? So this is the meaning of cost push inflation. It comes from raw material, labor, land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. From this is, you can say, capital means out of that working capital is raw material. So this is where the cost is coming from. Then that is cost push inflation. So, you can see how to, how you can say this demand pull inflation happens. Interest rates, if they are reduced, what happens to money in the hands of people? It will increase, then demand will increase. Demand pull inflation. Increased money supply because of any reason. If more money is there in the economy, then what happens to demand? Increases, demand pull inflation. Higher wages, more money in the hands of people, demand pull. But what is interesting about higher wages is, Wages are also a factor of production. That means labor is factor of production. As factor of production becomes costly, what happens to product price? Also increases. That means, these higher wages are creating both demand pull inflation and cost push inflation at the same time. Because of this reason. Devaluation of currency. This part we discussed. When we devalue currency, rupee value will reduce. As rupee value reduces, imports will become costly. Oil becomes costly. As oil becomes costly, then what happens to all the other products? They will also become costly, cost push inflation. Increase in VAT, right now you can think of it as GST. As GST increases, imagine earlier GST was 5% on 100 rupee product, it became 105. Now we increase it to 18%, it became 118, that means the price of the product increased or not. What is it called when general price level increases? That itself is inflation. You can see as GST increases, it is almost as if another raw material cost has increased. The effect is same, so that means cost push inflation. Inflationary expectations. <coughs> in the very first slide that we took in the first class, I told you economy is a social science, not a physical science. Social science means human behavior is involved. In physics, for example, it won't matter whether you believe in gravity or not. If you jump the, off the building, you will fall down. But in economy, it's not like this. If enough people believe something to be true, it will actually become true. If enough people believe that Adani shares are going to crash, then they will all feel, I have to sell these shares before they crash. Then everybody tries to sell. When everybody tries to sell, what happens to supply? Supply will increase, demand will reduce. Then what happens to price of Adani shares? Then they will crash. They are not crashing because something is wrong with Adani. They are crashing because people are panicking and selling them. You understood? When enough people believe that inflation is going to increase, they will feel that I should demand a raise from my boss because everything is becoming costly. Then the boss will feel I should raise the price of the product because everything is becoming costly. If everybody is thinking this and they are doing the same thing, what happens to inflation? It will increase. That means people's behavior has an impact on economy. You understood? Nature is level one chaotic system. We can predict it. Economy, all social sciences are level two chaotic systems. In complex systems, there is a classification. Level two means, once we are, we are you can say, our reaction to the system is affecting the system again. This is, you can say, level two chaotic system. That means because we all believe that it is going to happen, it will actually happen. That is, you can say, inflationary expectation. When enough people believe that inflation is about to happen, then inflation will happen. This is the meaning of inflationary expectations. 
demandful factors just extra other demandful factors I have given so that you can recognize it from options easily. As population increases, there was a debate actually among economists whether population increase should be considered or not. But the demand, you know, can say debate is largely settled. If population increases, just because population is high, demand will increase or not was the debate. But if population has increased, if they have to survive, do they have to buy something or not? Basic necessities at least they have to buy and they will continue to buy somehow. Maybe they will beg, borrow or steal, but they will buy. That means demand will increase. That means demand pool inflation will also increase. So then black money, as black money increases, usually back people who have black money, the tendency of these people is to spend more money. They will try to find the costliest thing and buy it. And when they keep on spending more and more cash, then what happens to inflation? Cash supply in the economy will increase, demand increases, inflation increases. Income, when people's income rises, demand pull inflation, this part we already know. A government, when it expends excessively, imagine in an election year, government you know, create some three, four extra schemes and gives a lot of money to people. Then also demand pull inflation will happen because people have more money on their hand. Cost push factor. <coughs> Infrastructure bottlenecks. Can anybody identify how it will create cost push inflation? Transportation. Increase the transportation cost. Imagine from point A to point B we need to transport. These carrots are produced 200 kilometers away. They should come to old Rajendra Nagar. How do they come? They will come through road. Imagine this road has 10,000 potholes in this 200 kilometer. They have to slow it down 10,000 times. That means the fuel that is required for this will increase by maybe 30 liters of diesel and that is extra cost that will be added to this or not. That means amount of time it will take is probably one day more. Then you have to pay for the rent for this truck and this driver. All this is transport cost added because of this infrastructure bottleneck. This cost of this product is increasing. <coughs> so this is the meaning of infrastructure bottleneck. Rise in MSP. As MSP increases for basic, you can say goods like uh, rice and wheat. 25, I think 25 items are there, if I'm not wrong, where MSP is declared. In this MSP, once it is declared, farmers will feel that we have a choice now to sell it to government, and they will not sell it below that price because government itself is buying wheat. Imagine at 25 rupees. You understood? Just for simplicity, let us assume 30 rupees is the MSP of wheat. If MSP of wheat is 30 rupees, farmers will only sell it at more than 30. Because if government itself is buying at 30, why will they sell it at less than 30? So the base price for MS, you know, wheat everywhere in the economy will become 30. If wheat is 30, then what about this? Imagine this Parleji biscuit manufacturer is buying this wheat. He will get it at a costlier price. What happens to the biscuits? Raw material has become costlier. And this biscuit will also become costlier. And that is cost push inflation. You understand? This is wheat. There are 25 other products where MSP is declared. In all these things, cost push inflation. I mean, all the things which will use these as raw materials, cost push inflation will occur. Then rise in international prices. We already discussed oil price. Similarly, any other raw material that we buy from outside also will create cost push inflation. Holding and black marketing. Holding, anybody knows the meaning of holding? If excess of something is stored away in some sort of a warehouse or something, imagine pulses. Some 100 kg pulses are produced, out of that 30 kg are bought and stored in a warehouse, supply reduces to 70 kg. Supply has reduced demand, is same, what happens to prices? People who use pulses as raw material, what happens to their products? Raw material is costly, so their finished product will become costly. So that is holding black marketing also causes, you can say, this cost push inflation. <coughs> Rise in indirect tax, we already saw, GST as it increases, it creates cost push inflation. <coughs> so, if inflation has happened and again it is coming back to normal, the prices are coming back to normal, this is what we call as reflation. Usually it is not used in a regular manner, but in textbooks they have given all the terms I put just together so that you get clarity. Then stagflation is actually important. Stagflation means, I have given here, it is usually inflation. Actually, growth and inflation, normal situation, how are they related? They are directly related. But in rare such situations, 10, 20 percent of the time, growth is not happening, but inflation is happening. That means they are not directly related in this point. That is what we call as stagflation. Usually in India, stagflation occurs mostly because of import prices increasing. That means depreciation of currency or oil price increase or something. Imagine oil prices have increased, we are importing oil at double the price, then everything becomes costly in India, not because of increasing demand, but because of cost, cost push inflation. 
If everything is double the cost, imagine our household expenses are 30,000 a month, it will increase to 60,000. That means what happens to our remaining disposable income? Reduces. It reduces. As disposable income reduces, what happens to demand? Demand also reduces. When demand reduces, what happens to growth? You can see growth has reduced, inflation has increased. This is what we call as unemployment will also reduce if growth has reduced because nobody is producing more now. And that means this is called as stagflation. Stagflation is a dangerous situation for an economy. It is what every economy dreads. In economy, you can say the best way to prevent, I mean best way to avoid stagflation. Get out of stagflation is very difficult. So the best way is actually to prevent it. Before it happens, we try to take measures to ensure that we don't get into it in the first place. Why is it so problematic? Because once we get into stagflation, we don't have an easy prescribed way to get out of it. It is like we are stuck there, somehow like a car stuck in mud, somehow you have to turn left, right, every direction and check which one works. So there is no easy way out of this. Why there is no easy way out? Because once we are stuck in stagflation, right now growth is very low, inflation is very high. Normally, what do we do when inflation is very high? How to control it? Monetary tightening, we take, we increase interest rates. If we increase interest rates, now what happens to growth? It will go out negative. It is already negative, it will go further negative. That means we create a depression. <coughs> if we don't want it, imagine we want to increase growth. We push up, push more currency into the economy, then what happens to inflation? It will increase further, creating, you can say, another problem. So that means there is no easy way out of this. Because of this reason, it is a not a very good situation to be in. And to avoid the situation, economists will do everything, whatever is possible, even if it is very costly. For example, whenever oil price increases in India, what we did was, during Manmohan Singh era in 2012-13, they gave huge subsidy on oil. Oil price has increased so much because of cartelization between all the oil producing countries. So we gave half the price of oil, whatever was there, government gave it, remaining half people gave it. When government was paying for half the price, subsidization of oil was happening. At this point, if because oil is cheap, everything else will become cheap. At least inflation problem we have solved. Maybe we are paying for it, but it is still, we are not getting into stagflation. You understood? So this is basically stagflation and how we avoid it is by giving subsidies so that we don't get into it in the first place. <coughs> Skewflation is very simple. Skewed means what? Skewed is imbalanced. We don't have inflation in everything, all general goods, only a section of type of goods have become costly. That is what we call as skewflation. Sometimes it is only food products, sometimes it is only electronic goods, could be because of some raw material price increase or something. This is what we call as skewflation. <coughs> you understood this? <coughs> Any questions so far? So this another type of classification is how much inflation is happening, this is very simple. Ideal situation is low and creeping, that means as of now what is happening, I mean as of now whatever is desirable, two to, I mean, 2 to 6 percent, we can assume it to be low or creeping. It is healthy level of inflation. If it becomes too much, galloping or runaway, double to triple digit. Recently in Sri Lanka, Turkey, these are examples of double to triple digit. And hyperinflation means extremely high, 4 digit, 5 digit inflation, like how it happened in Bolivia, in you can say, it happened in Zimbabwe. These are examples of, you can say, this hyperinflation. When hyperinflation happens, this the economy is about to die. That means there is no way we can, we here at least we can somehow putting in ICU or something, we can get it back to normal. But at this point, it is almost too late. There is no way it is very difficult to get back. In Zimbabwe, for example, they started printing bigger and bigger and bigger notes. 1 million, 10 million, 100 million, 1 billion, trillion also. People used to take a billion dollar note to buy one liter of milk in the shop. Then they got tired of counting number of zeros and dumped that currency. So that means that is the end of the economy. You understood this? <coughs> this is hyperinflation. And if you do not want to get into that, then we should always try to maintain it. When it goes here, then we should take whatever measures are necessary to bring it back to low or creeping. <coughs> bottleneck inflation. What is the meaning of bottleneck? Neck of a bottle means, why is it created like this? So that when we pour water, all water should not come out at once. Bottleneck means something which is restricting, you can say, flow of the economy. Bottleneck means something has happened in the economy which is restricting. So, supply falls drastically due to natural disasters. Imagine because of COVID, people were afraid to come to work because at work a lot of other people will be there, it may lead to spread of disease. So, labor became a, you can say, bottleneck. We did not have enough labor to work 
and this led to you can say production not happening wherever there is requirement of physical need or can say physical space where people have to meet. Software for example people can work from home there was no bottleneck there. Wherever textiles have to be produced you know a lot of people have to come together there there was bottleneck inflation. You understood the meaning of bottleneck. Bottleneck means some sort of natural disaster like maybe covid or imagine some earthquake happened and in a cluster of all the textile producing industries have collapsed. And then we do not have textile producing industries much in other areas then textile prices will increase. This is bottleneck inflation. During world wars for example, lot of people went to war and sufficient amount of labor was not present. Similar type of bottleneck inflation happened. <coughs> Core and headline inflation, this is important concept. <coughs> Core and headline means in India inflation <coughs> you can consider all the products. Among that food and fuel is also included. But the problem with food and fuel is we do not have control over their prices. Fuel prices are controlled by what? demand and supply outside the country that means all the countries put together. So fuel price we cannot control, food price also we cannot easily control because it is dependent on monsoon. We do not have control over weather so that means food and fuel prices are not in our control but they will impact inflation. But how to identify whether we are controlling what we can control at least. So we have created core inflation which is different from headline. Core inflation means other than food and fuel whatever is present that is called core inflation. When we look at core and headline difference, imagine core inflation actually is right now low and headline inflation is high. What does it tell us? Where is inflation coming from? It is coming from food and fuel. That means we cannot blame the government because they have done everything they can but still inflation is happening. Imagine both are high. It means that government has mishandled the economy or it is not capable. It is even though it was possible it did not do it. It did not control inflation. By, ident by identifying the difference between core and headline we can identify where the inflation is coming from and that is the objective of having this core and headline inflation. The difference between them is food and fuel. Recently in economic survey they have created one more concept called as refined core inflation. So in this core inflation what was happening was even though fuel prices have been removed, fuel prices that have been added as a cost of production of carrots or whatever we just discussed that part was not removed from core inflation. Imagine petrol price increases, diesel price increases, we keep it aside. But because of petrol diesel price increasing all the other prices have also increased that was still part of core inflation. Now to be able to identify you can say actual inflation other than petrol and diesel what should we do? We should remove that part of imagine carrots were earlier 30 rupees now they have become 40 because of increase in petrol cost. We need to remove that part which is leading which is caused by increase in petrol cost and that means petrol for vehicle, diesel for vehicle and lubricants other fuels this part is also removed and then we will get refined core which is even you can say smaller than core inflation. You understood this? This is basically the meaning of refined core inflation, core inflation and headline. Refined core is a probable question in exam because it is current affairs and recent concept that they have created. <coughs> Everybody is clear so far. <coughs> so <coughs> okay, we will take from structural and imported inflation after break. We will take 15 minute break and continue.
वेलकम बैक एवरीवन सो वी आर लुकिंग एट इन्फ्लेशन राइट नाउ एनी क्वेश्चन एंटिल हियर नो क्वेश्चन ओके सो we have seen different types of inflation they have been given different names so we have to continue from structural inflation usually in economy whenever we say we use the word structural it means something related to some uh, structural means we are talking about long standing problems in the economy problems which will probably take decades to resolve something which is not going to be consider for example logistics problem what is the meaning of logistics moving any product from point a to point b is logistics if we have this this sort of a problem how to resolve it by building better infrastructure by having better roads better railways how long do you think it will take to replace all the roads and railways and shipping routes everything in the country it probably takes 2 to 3 decades and that means it is a structural problem we cannot resolve this problem in a year in 6 months or so structural problems means problems which are there since a long time and probably will continue to be there because we need massive amount of resources and time to resolve them if these type of structural problems are creating you can say inflation in india we just saw logistics as a problem and logistics also creates inflation this also we saw then that is called as structural inflation imagine in india manufacturing sector is not very well developed service sector is well developed because manufacturing sector is not well developed we have to import some products from other countries this is also a structural problem in india lack of manufacturing in electronic goods or some some chipset or something will create inflation in that particular products that is also structural inflation you understood this <coughs> type of persistent what does it mean when we say persistent it is not easily gone it is it is going to be there for a while so it is a type of persistent inflation caused by deficiencies in certain conditions in the economy backward agricultural sector in india we have not invested much in growth of agricultural infrastructure we have mostly invested in farmers and not in farming farmers means we have tried to reduce the distress of farmers by giving them some income support but we have not been able to improve the kind of technology that we are used using as of now if you look at the technology used in farming it is the same as what we used during indus valley civilization same wooden plows and two oxen are being used so that means you can see that we have not put enough investment <coughs> next is inefficient distribution storage this also we just saw if distribution or logistics pro problem is exists that will create structural inflation imagine we don't have proper storage facilities we don't have we it is going to take a long time to distribute agricultural produce imagine we produce some fruits or vegetables and by the time we take it to some place 30 40% of them are uh, have already gone bad then what is happening to supply of fruits vegetables supply is decreasing by 30 40% demand is same what happens to prices prices is going to are going to increase that is structural inflation you understood this imported inflation when we have to import something from outside the country and this is costly because it is costly it is going to make the finished product within india costly this is same thing whatever we saw with regard to oil price can be applied here sometimes if all the inflation that is happening in the country is only because of imports then we call it as in imported inflation it is just another term how imported inflation occurs because of imports becoming costly how imports will become costly in india it is mostly because of depreciation of rupee depreciation of rupee already we discussed i mean rupee value reduces in international currency exchange market our imports will become costly exchange rate depreciation leads to increased cost of imports hence goods in domestic market also become costly this is called as imported inflation <coughs> open and suppressed this is very simple consider from another perspective a person has diabetes this person imagine is 65 years old if he does not take any this diabetes tablet his sugar levels will be high if he takes this tablet it will go down when he does not take the tablet the sugar levels are like open sugar levels after he takes the tablet it is suppressed they are suppressed by the tablet similarly when government uses policy measures to control inflation it is suppressed inflation if government is not doing anything whatever the level of inflation that will exist it is called as open inflation 
usually the root cause of the inflation is coming from some somewhere else for example imagine oil price increase if government takes measures to give subsidy on oil then inflation is suppressed imagine government suddenly in the middle stops giving subsidy then what happens to inflation it will re-emerge just like if you stop take imagine this person takes the stop with taking diabetes tablet it will come back again same thing happens here open means inflation that results when government does not suppress it with subsidies or monetary policy suppressed means we are suppressing it that means using subsidies etc but the root cause is not resolved root cause is coming from maybe oil price increase or something else we are not yet resolved the root cause right now we are just addressing the symptoms that means increase in prices so it may re-emerge if policies change that is what is called suppressed inflation you understood the difference between open and suppressed <coughs> then coming to okay measurement this part we'll come to later measures to check inflation this part is very simple how to control inflation we have already seen lot of things importing goods which are in short supply imagine in india some uh, pulses are in short supply if pulses are in short supply we import pulses from you can say imagine afghanistan pakistan bangladesh then pulse supply will increase demand is same supply increases what happens to prices prices will reduce that means by importing you can say pulses from other countries it is possible for us to control inflation cutting down taxes on production to bring down prices as of now tax on some item is 28 percent if you bring, bring it down to maybe you can say three percent 25 percent reduction in price will happen immediately or not so this is a direct impact that will happen immediately that is one more measure tighter monetary fiscal policy to reduce liquidity <coughs> that means <coughs> So, tighter monetary policy means reduce the demand, reduce the cash, that means reduce the money supply, be increasing interest rates. And fiscal policy means by increasing taxes and reducing spending, we do the same thing to reduce the liquidity in the economy. As liquidity reduces, demand reduces. As demand reduces, inflation reduces. Ban on exports. Can anybody understand, uh, explain how ban on exports will lead to reduction in inflation? Because we are unable to export, imagine onions are produced in India, but we are unable, they are not able to export it to other countries because we have banned it then what happens to supply of onions in india it will increase as supply increases demand supply match you can say mismatch reduces inflation reduces so these are all measures with which we control inflation these are <coughs> being used by india coming to phillips curve we already discussed what is phillips curve earlier it is a graph that shows relation between inflation and unemployment it shows inverse relationship between the two this part among all the graphs that we have already seen we saw phillips curve Coming to effects of inflation, in the effects of inflation, one aspect is important. It redistributes wealth from creditors to debtors. That means whoever is giving the loan, they will not benefit much. Whoever is taking the loan, they will benefit more. Imagine interest rate is 10%. It looks like this person is paying 10% interest every year to the bank. But in reality, imagine inflation is already 7%. So how much is actually he, he, he is paying to the bank? Only 3% is actually, you can say, interest because 7% inflation is happening, 10% if he pays, is actually getting a very cheap loan from the bank or not. That means the person who is borrowing it, this person is actually earning or benefiting more compared to the bank. Sometimes inflation increases up to 10%, it is interest-free loan. If it is more than 10%, actually bank himself itself is almost paying for this person to take this loan. You understood this. So that means you can see it is redistributing wealth from creditors means who is giving the loan to debtors who are taking the loan. So this is the meaning of, this is one effect of inflation, whoever takes loan they will benefit. So whenever inflation increases, what happens to number of loans taken in the economy? At least in big businesses, people understand the concept of this inflation and how it works, it will increase. Number of people, experts in businesses, they will start taking more loans because inflation is high. <coughs> Indicates rising aggregate demand, comparatively lower supply. If inflation is high, what does it tell us about demand supply equation? Which one is higher? Demand is higher, supply is relatively lower. That is why there is inflation. Demand is more than supply. So, shows higher purchase because demand is high means people are trying to have both willingness and ability. That means it shows higher purchasing power. Investment in the economy is boosted by inflation because of two reasons. Investment will increase because first thing, we already know that demand is higher than supply. When demand is higher than supply, will you produce, if you are a producer, will you produce more or less? More, because demand is a, you feel that I can sell more. As of now, if I produce, I can sell more. That means you will start producing more. So you can see higher inflation indicates higher demand suggests entrepreneurs to expand their production. Second, if you want to take loans for this right now, when inflation is high, will it be beneficial or not? 
that means you will take more loans because you take more loans and you produce more you can see it will lead to a virtuous cycle whenever inflation is slightly high you understand as production increases more people are employed as more people are employed they get salaries demand increases and a virtuous cycle is created that is why a little bit of inflation is good for the economy it should always be slightly higher <coughs> incomes of salaried employees reduce in real times i mean this part have i given in the slide <coughs> okay incomes of salaried employees you can say means usually salaried employees will get increment only once a year that means their salary will not change on a daily basis so what is happening is imagine a person is getting 10 lakh rupees salary per year but inflation actually is reducing the value of money whatever he is getting so what happens is until next year he will not get increment but how much he is getting right now its value is reducing consistently or not every month he is getting the same 80000 or something and this month with 80000 what he can buy next month he can buy less and after one day after that he can buy even less that means incomes of salaried employees reduce in real terms real means what nominal and real nominal minus inflation is real this we saw in the first class if you remove 80 80000 is the salary he is getting imagine 1 lakh is the salary he is getting right now inflation is 8% that means if you remove that 8% 9 actually even if he is getting 1 lakh 92000 is the actual real income that means real income keeps reducing as inflation keeps increasing or not so this is what we are saying because salary remains constant but firms or companies what do they do as inflation increase what they do is they will immediately increase the price of their products because they have the freedom to increase the price of the product as they increase the price of the product their nominal incomes increase but usually the increase in price of the product will be equal to inflation only that means their real income what has happened to that it will remain same so that means incomes of firms may increase nominally but in real terms they remain same imagine earlier uh, a product was sold at 100 right now there is 8% inflation it will now be sold at 108 it will look like suddenly 8 rupees extra is coming in in the account book but how much they are earning if you see last year and this year in real terms it is still same you understood so this is you can say difference between employees and firms how they are you can how they will be affected by inflation <coughs> savings are likely to increase during low inflation that means if inflation is slightly you can say little bit people will feel instead of keeping a suitcase of cash at home if i put it in the bank at least i get that 4% 5% interest from the bank something is better than nothing so they will try to put it in the bank and that means savings will increase as cash value erodes money in the bank will get at least some interest but if inflation keeps increasing and it gets to maybe 8% 10% if he is getting 4% here inflation is 10% what will be the net interest he is getting imagine bank is giving 4% inflation is 10% he is getting minus 6% if he is getting minus 6% is it a good idea to keep the money in the bank no that means he will take out the money from the bank when he takes out the money from the bank you can see if he takes out the money from the bank what will be the impact on the economy earlier we have already seen this part if people take out money from the bank money multiplier effect will be affected if money multiplier effect will be affected then money supply in the economy itself will reduce and as money supply reduces demand reduces as demand reduces it creates a vicious cycle so that means you can see one of the problem of inflation is people take out money from the bank which is going to affect the entire economic system so this is one problem savings may result in negative interest rates real interest rates so savings rate reduces what exactly is savings rate if you aggregate this person every citizen in the country is equivalent to one person how much money he has or how out of that how much money has earned this month out of that imagine 30 rupees he puts into the bank account this 30% is savings rate how much money the country is earning is gdp how much of this we are putting in the bank is savings rate you understood imagine banks have given loans and we have invested that money that is called investment rate somebody took a loan from the bank and invested 30% imagine is savings rate investment rate is 33 34% how is it possible that investment is more than savings because investment is not only coming from india savings some foreigners are bringing their investment and foreign investment is also happening in india you understand in a country like india which is a developing country investment rate will be higher than savings rate because foreigners are also investing in our india so this is the meaning of savings rate and investment rate of a country <coughs> so then consumption falls as goods and services get costlier 
when high inflation is happening people's disposable income has actually reduced they will feel that everything is costly let us postpone buying we will reduce our you can say unnecessary spending is reduced direct taxes increase as they are imposed on value which is inflated <coughs> so this part is called as fiscal drag we will see later in fiscal policy fiscal drag in simple terms i'll try to explain if a person is in a tax bracket where imagine he is getting so far 9.5 lakh salary but now because of inflation he will push he will salary will be pushed into 10.5 lakh or something now tax bracket has changed he has to pay more tax or not if he pay more tax actually in real income real terms his money overall money will even reduce instead of increasing you understood this leads to fiscal drag and this drag means people have less money on their hands and demand reduces and this is called as fiscal drag so this part in fiscal policy we will di discuss how fiscal drag happens what we have done to solve that problem <coughs> that is the meaning of direct taxes increase means government is not trying to mo collect more taxes but people will all shift to the next tax bracket because they are earning slightly more because of inflation as they shift to next tax bracket they have to pay more tax or not so government start collecting more tax that is why direct taxes increase as they are imposed on the value value is inflated so they will collect more tax you understood inflation is happening people are earning a little more in, re in nominal terms so they will have to pay more tax <coughs> currency depreciates with inflation in case of flexible exchange rate when inflation in india goes to be very high imagine it is 12% 13% then investors in india will not be interest or you can say foreign investors will not be interested to continue to invest in india if inflation is too high if inflation is too high it is called as overheating of the economy it is not a good sign something is wrong in the economy and it is overheating if it is wrong will investors like to invest in some, when something is wrong or everything is right so that means dollar will outflow will happen from india when inflation is too high they don't know exactly what is wrong but inflation is too high means some it is an indicator that something is wrong ideally what should happen is imagine demand and supply equation how it works this is demand and this is supply slight increase in demand over supply will lead to slight inflation this is healthy level of inflation so investors will invest and producers will produce more so that they can you can say cater to that demand but if inflation is you know 10% 12% 20% it shows that demand is somewhere here and supply is somewhere here until the demand went there why suppliers other suppliers have not been able to supply is a some sort of a puzzle in the mind of the investor first thing second thing if inflation has already went up to 20% if investor invests money and he is going to earn some money 100 rupees in at that will be an inflated 120% inflation means how much will he actually earn 80. it is only 80 whatever returns he will earn it will keep on reducing so people who don't want to invest in countries where inflation is high <coughs> because their returns keep on reducing so they will take their dollar out of india when dollar outflow happens from india now imagine that international currency exchange market again some sort of a warehouse when an investor who has invested in india takes his dollar out he will go to this market and he will say see i will give you my uh, you can say i will give you the rupee he will take the rupee from india he will go there because he has invested in rupee in india or dollar in india what currency can you invest in in rupee he will take the rupee he will say i will give the rupee you give me the dollar whoever has dollar then rupee supply in international market what happens increase. it will increase that means what happens to you can say currency it will depreciate you understood so how depreciation appreciation happens is only because of this much it is very simple in the international currency exchange market either india's india's supply of rupee will increase or decrease and based on that you can say depreciation appreciation will happen <coughs> currency depreciates with inflation in face of flexible exchange rate so <coughs> exportable items of economy gain competitive prices when depreciation of a currency happens is it is it an advantage for exports or a disadvantage advantage. it is an advantage we took the example of a mango chinese mango indian mango and we saw if the currency depreciates actually it is cheaper for somebody abroad to buy an indian product so that means it is good for exports but the problem is for a country like india which is import dependent what is good for exports is bad for imports oil becomes costlier even though our mango becomes cheaper elsewhere and we sell more of them but imports have become costly and it creates you can say cost push inflation in india that is one more problem exportable items of an economy gain competitive prices in the world market due to this volume of export increases this is true inflation will lead to lower imports or if they are essential imports costlier imports sometimes we cannot avoid even if they are costly we still have to buy them like oil 
then we cannot reduce then the costly imports will become costlier or lower depending upon whether are they are essential or not essential <coughs> so this is you can say another effect of inflation then <coughs> look at this question this 2021 with reference to indian economy demand pull inflation can be caused or increased by which of the following can expansionary policy cause demand pull inflation or not yes, yes. if one is true which one can you eliminate fiscal stimulus is also actually expansion only it is another word for it. if two is true which one can you eliminate you can't eliminate anything inflation indexing wages indexing means you can think of it as linking actual word english meaning is just linking when you link wages to inflation when hmm? right when inflation increases wages increase that is the meaning of inflation indexing we are looking at what will cause inflation to increase you understood inflation increase will lead to wage increase this is called as indexing question is not about what is the consequence question is about what is the cause of inflation you understood this so that means cause of expansionary policy is cause of inflation fiscal stimulus is cause of inflation wages increase as indexing happens is actually a consequence of inflation not a cause and higher purchasing power as purchasing power increases this is also true the four is correct which one can eliminate c can be eliminated raising interest rates as interest rates are increasing what happens to inflation it will actually reduce so five is wrong if five is wrong you can say d can be eliminated <coughs> so in economy this cause consequence relationship is one place where many students make a mistake try to identify and you know clear relationship like this draw it what is the cause whether they are asking the cause or consequence first thing second thing what is you know what are all of them are the causes or consequences if you draw it like this draw it out you will understand it second common mistake most people make is if there is one causes x causes y they are not just thinking about this much they are thinking about y causing z and z causing a and b and they will just keep going if you do this also questions will go wrong they are usually upsc exam has very low expectation from you i told you in the first class they are going to ask only 90 percent of the time only one level of link whether it has any direct impact or not this is the kind of questions they will ask sometimes 10 percent of the time they will ask second layer if you are unable to find the answer using this first link then only you go to this second link you understood this <coughs> so coming to measurement of inflation earlier there was one slide of measurement of inflation how we measure inflation so here i try to give you some sort of a general approach on how we are actually measuring inflation right now what we do is consider from a person's perspective all the products that this person will actually buy in a year imagine there are 400 odd items that a normal person would buy including food clothing everything whatever the person buys so inflation means what in this how much price increases happen from one year to the next year this is what is inflation so imagine this was in 2022 in 2023 we have to consider increase in price that has happened from here to here but the problem is are all products equal some are more important than others or not whenever some are more important than others in economy we will use weightage and we will give more weightage to important products like maybe rice and wheat or you can say dal or something which are basic necessities and less useful things may be you know perfume is you can say not necessary for survival it will be given weightage less slightly lesser weightage so that means you can see that out of 400 items all of them are not equal so we will give different levels of weightage for each one of them when we multiply it with weightage we will get a final number if you add up all that numbers you will get one number here ideally imagine without weightage what would we do if you add up the prices of last year it was 30,000 this year if you add up it is 33,000 that means ideally it should be 10 percent inflation if you don't give weightage but if you give weightage multiply it with weightage and then add up then you will get a bigger number but you convert that number into <coughs> okay so far you have understood you can say uh, how we are getting to this number this number is converted imagine to 100 in the base year 100 means once this big number imagine 350000 is converted to 100 next year the same prices will become 380000 
then that will be 103 or something. From 100 to 103, how much percentage increase has happened? 3% is the inflation year on year. This is how we calculate it. But base year means what? That is one more thing here. Base year means usually the year in which we consider the basket of these 400 items. Basket means whatever items we are considering whose prices we are listing out, that is called as a basket. This basket, can it be same in 1990, 2000, 2010, 2020, is it same? Why is it different? Because people are buying different things in every decade. 1990 people used to, men used to buy loose shirts and bell bottom pants. Nowadays only women are buying it. That means you can see tastes of people have changed over a period of time. And earlier there was no mobile phones, people were buying some CD players or something, nowadays they, they don't exist. So that means over a period of time we have to remove things which have gone out of use and keep on adding things which have come into use. That means the basket keeps changing every, you can say, certain number of years. That means we change the base year as we change the basket of goods and whenever we change the base year, whatever this big number comes out, we set it back to 100. Why do we set it to 100? Just for simplicity. There is no, you can say, because we don't want to big, look at big numbers, just for to make it simple, we set the base year index to a number to 100. From next year onwards, imagine base year is 100, next year it became 106. It shows whatever costs 100 rupees in the base year, costs 106 rupees right now. This is what is index. CPI is calculated in this manner. CPI means consumer price index. Now I'll try to summarize it. Now you, because you know what is base year and all the associated concepts, we consider in any particular given year, the basket of items that was decided in base year. And all these items, we will multiply with weightage, whatever weightage we have given. Then we will get another number. We'll add up all these numbers. We'll get a big number, 4 lakh or 5 lakh or something. And this number is converted into, you can say, imagine in base year, this number was 3 lakh. Right now it is 4.5 lakh. That means there is 50% increase from base year to now. If base year is 100, right now it will be 150. You understood? If CPI index is showing 150, what does it tell us? Whatever cost 100 rupees in the base year, cost 150 rupees right now. This is what it means. If CPI index randomly, let us consider 456 is what it is showing, it means whatever cost 100 rupees in the base year, whenever that was, maybe 2012 or something, right now the same product will cost 456 rupees. This is what CPI index tells us. You understood this? This is how inflation is measured in India using CPI. A rate of inflation is measured using price indices. A price index is a weighted average of prices of number of goods and services. Weighted average, we are not considering here, you can say just average of goods prices. Weighted means we are giving weights and then we are considering. Average everybody knows, divide all the price, I mean, multi, add up everything divided by number of items, 400 or something is the average. So this is weighted average. Then we will get a number. That number is converted to 100 in the base year. From then on, how much increase has happened from base year? Imagine in 2024, we change the base year again. At that time, CPI index was already 600. It will again be set to 100 again in 2024. And from then again, we will keep on increasing from 100. You understood? Every time we change the base year, we change the index to 100. And why do we change base year? Because we have to change the basket. Because since 2012, 2020, a lot of changes would have happened on what we are buying. So we have to change the basket. Everybody understood what is this basket, weights, and finally we are arriving at the CPI index. When we look at the CPI index, this is what it should tell us. <coughs> In the index, total weight is taken as 100 at a particular year of the past, the base year. Compared to the current year, it shows a rise or fall in prices of the current year. When we look at, imagine base year is 100, this year it is showing 92. What does it tell us? Deflation has happened, that means the prices have actually reduced compared to base year. Whatever cost 100 rupees in base year is right now 92 rupees. This is what it shows. <coughs> so, in measurement of inflation, right now you understood how measurement is done using some sort of index. Index means it is a number which shows how something. CPI, consumer price index means it will show how consumer prices have changed over the years. That number will tell us something. So, now coming to base effect. <coughs> Base effect means, because inflation earlier we have seen that it should remain, it should be, what is the healthy level of inflation? 2 to 6 percent. What percentage are we talking about? From last year to this year, if you compare, <coughs> how much increase should have happened in the CPI index, that is the percentage we are talking about. And that percent should be 2 to 6 percent. So that is healthy level of inflation. 
you understood so far imagine last year because of covid somehow this inflation had reduced negative 10 percent and this year if it comes back to normal from minus 10 to you get it comes back to 6 it will look like as if it is big or not minus 10 to 6 increase in percentage terms it will be like huge amount maybe 20 30 percent or some you understood this so sudden increase it will look like there is a sudden increase but in fact is it, it is not a sudden increase it is because of last year's prices becoming low as of now it looks like it is big because the base of calculation we have we are using is low it looks like it is big this is called as base effect sometimes base effect will actually give us wrong interpretation of the data it will show inflation is 36 percent but in reality if you look at it it has not changed much because last year because of some sort of recession or something it had reduced and comparing to that right now it is high that is why it looks like it is big so how so how to avoid this sort of misinterpretation if you look only comparison between previous year to this year then this will happen when you zoom out in the graph and take five year picture ten year picture then you will get a clear picture that this is happening because of base effect and there is no serious concern right now you understood this this is the meaning of base effect and why do we use base effect we use base effect to you can say you know identify whether our interpretation is correct or it is happening because of base effect eliminate the possibility that it is happening because of this sort of calculation error or you can say some sort of comparison uh, problem you understood this <coughs> this is the meaning it refers to impact of rise in price level in the previous year or the corresponding rise in price level in the current year because we are doing comparison from previous year to current year it creates this sort of a problem of comparison that is what we call as base effect you understood imagine you are writing mock test last time we, last week you wrote mock test suddenly the price decreased decreased this year this week again you wrote mock test and the price increased if i mean uh, score increased if you compare it it will look like the percentage change is very high compared to last week to this week but actually you are already getting this much if you are comparing from here to here it will look like it is high so the comparison should not always be from only the previous test you should look at the general trend that is how we avoid this sort of a mistake this is the meaning of base effect so base effect we saw this actually during covid you can see gdp had reduced it to minus 23.8 and suddenly it increased back here it looked like as if you can say massive increase in gdp has happened but it would it be right if we say sudden increase in production has happened no because of base effect it looked like you can say huge increase in production has happened you understood this <coughs> next coming to gdp deflator so gdp deflator actually is mathematical formula is nominal gdp divided by real gdp but what is the concept of gdp deflator you have to understand it is only a conceptual figure usually we don't usually calculate it uh, because it is very complex to calculate it is only for conceptual understanding that we discuss gdp deflator usually we calculate cpi wpi for inflation gdp deflator what exactly is it to understand this let us compare it with cpi <coughs> cpi we just saw we are considering from the perspective of the consumer whatever the consumer buys everything is a part of cpi cpi reflects the price of goods and services bought by the final consumer whereas gdp deflator is not considering only those 400 products bought by consumers it is considering imagine 10 lakh products are produced in the country every product's price is considered by gdp deflator consumers are not buying all the products imagine for example isro will make a satellite no consumer will buy it but gdp deflator will add it because it is produced in India. GDP means what? Whatever is produced in India is added. Imagine consumer will not buy the bullets made in ordnance factory, some machine gun made for army or something. All these things people are not buying, but they will still be added in GDP deflator. You understood? And some other things people are buying imported good is not added into GDP deflator because it is not added into GDP. Imported good means where is it produced? Outside the territory of India. In GDP, what do we add? only whatever is produced inside the territory of india is added that means you can see that in gdp deflator whatever is not added in gdp is not added but in cpi even oil if it is produced outside the country it has to be added in cpi because it is one thing that a person buys petrol diesel etc but it cannot be added in gdp deflator because that oil was not produced in india you understood this gdp deflator will not take only those 400 products same process it will take for all 10 lakh products theoretically if we can do it then that is how we will do it we will give weights for all 10 lakh products then we will multiply and we will get a number weighted average is taken then you can say that is how we should calculate gdp deflator you understood the difference between cpi and gdp deflator 
GDP deflator takes every product produced in India. CPI takes only those products which are actually being bought by consumers. <coughs> so example same ISRO you can see satellite is not added into CPI but it is added into GDP deflator. Petroleum product because it is not produced in India may not be added in GDP deflator but it will be added in CPI. CPI compares the price of fixed basket of goods. There is a fixed 400 basket of goods whereas GDP deflator there is no actually fixed basket or you can say that everything is a part of G that is a part of GDP itself is the basket of GDP deflator. You understood? So this is the difference between GDP deflator and CPI. <coughs> Next coming to WPI. Now if you look at this image probably you will understand what is CPI WPI better. So you can see in this image There is something wrong with this. <coughs> so CPI is where you are buying from retail shop and you can say that is at this price if we consider you can say product price then it is CPI. Wholesale means retail shops are buying somewhere from a you can say big wholesaler or you know distributor or something at this level if we consider the price then that will call a same process is same it will be called WPI. PPI is if producer whether it is a farmer or a factory or somebody at that price if we take it into consideration then it will be called PPI. In India as of now we have WPI CPI and there is a proposal to create another one which is called as PPI that is producer price index. So why do we need so many? Right now actually we are using CPI but always in India we did not use this CPI. We used to use WPI because during cold war era India used to align with USSR more than USA and all the countries which aligned with USSR used to use WPI. So our comparison we wanted to do with 5 year plans everything with those countries. So we use it WPI. Whereas all the countries which aligned with USA they use it CPI. But after USSR fell in 1990 all the countries started adopting you know CPI more and more because majority of countries had already adopted CPI. By 2014 India also started adop adopted CPI. So now India has shifted completely to CPI as a primary measure of inflation in India. There is a problem with WPI. We are measuring the inflation at which level? Wholesale level. And that means after wholesale level at retail level if the consumer price is more that will not be reflected in WPI. This is one big problem with WPI. <coughs> so now if you look at the differences between the two then you will get majority of the things here with regard to WPI CPI. Consider WPI amounts to average change in price at wholesale level here it is retail level. Who is releasing it is factual information you can see it and uh, this CSO is now part of NSO. Then here one important aspect that can be asked in prelims, this part is important, WPI measures only goods and CPI measures both goods and services. It is very rare that services are sold in wholesale, you can't buy 100 doctor consultations at once or something. That means you can remember it like this where you can say wholesale mostly only goods are sold whereas in CPI goods services both are there. And here in wholesale price index usually it is wholesale stage of transaction earlier it, it was defined as first stage but now because PPI is being defined as a separate first stage right now you can consider it as whole stage and consumer price index you can consider it as final stage of the transaction. Prices who will actually pay for wholesale price? Imagine other cottage industries small industries will also buy from wholesalers. Imagine a small candle making factory they will buy the wax from wholesale wax seller some perfume from wholesale wax seller they will make candles. So this is how you can say manufacturers are also buying from wholesalers. Other smaller wholesalers are also buying from wholesalers. Even retailers also are buying from wholesalers. So who is buying from them if you see. But who is buying from you know retail shops is only consumers. And how many items around 400 odd items here and 697 items here. And this part is also important for prelims. <coughs> what is actually included here? Manufacturing inputs, intermediate goods are also included in wholesale price index. Like I said this perfume or wax is intermediate good or manufacturing input. Will people buy bulk wax or perfume? No. People will only buy what is relevant for people. Education, communication, transport, recreation, apparel, you can see everything is relevant only to citizens, normal people. Here they will buy minerals, machinery, basic metals, all these things also. One aspect which is important probable question can come is intermediate goods are part of WPI. Sometimes candle wax has been added to WPI. Candle also gets added to WPI. 
what is the problem with this? There is multiple counting bias that we saw in GDP we removed it by considering only final goods whereas in WPI we have not removed it. You understood? This is one more problem with WPI <coughs> because we have not removed it. Base year is 2011, 12 and 12. 2011, 12 because in this CPI basically I mean this is WPI. WPI actually they will use uh, in USSR and you can say all these countries they started using financial year as the year and we also started using the same thing so that comparison is easier. Whereas in US and associated countries January to December and financial year both are same and that is why they are only using 2012 as you can say the base year there so that comparison with them is easier. How many countries are actually using CPI if you see there are more now because USSR has collapsed. Very few countries including India are using WPI because of historical legacy we are continuing to calculate it but that is not the primary measure of inflation. So when the data is released is also factual information <coughs> you can go through it. So remaining aspect of CPI and WPI you can read this this is also factual information and in this numbers are not important but it is better if you remember the order order means highest is food and beverages here one more small concept is present weightage given to food and beverages in CPI is very high in uh, there is a law in economy called as Angel's law. Angel's law says that as expenditure or, I mean as incomes of you can say people raise proportion of income on expenditure keeps reducing proportion of income on food that means as incomes of citizens raise proportion of income spent on food keeps reducing. Consider for example, a person Rikshawala is earning 10,000 rupees, he is probably spending 7,000 for food for him and his family complete 70%. Imagine income will increase to 1 lakh rupees, then they will probably spend 35,000, 40,000, that is only 40%, from 70 to 40% it reduces or Imagine you are earning 10 lakh rupees, probably you will spend 1 lakh on food, how much else can people eat, only that much. So that means 10% only, if you are earning 1 crore, then also it will not exceed 1 lakh, people can't eat much. That means you can see now it has reduced to 1%. The proportion of income people are spending on food will keep reducing. Right now if we are giving weightage of 45% on food, what does it indicate about Indian economy? It is a low income economy because this much of weightage if every family is spending on food, it means that you can say India is still a low income economy. You understood? Maybe somewhere middle income because it is not more than 50%, it is not less than 20%. <coughs> so this is Angel's law. And this is what it indicates with regard to CPI. <coughs> so there are actually CPI is calculated separately for rural areas, urban areas. Rural area CPI is called agricultural laborers, urban area is called industrial workers. Why we are calculating separately? Because rural basket and urban basket are different. In rural areas people consume slightly different type of goods. So we created separate baskets and we combine both of them called as CPI rural urban combined. India's official measure of inflation is this CPI rural urban combined. When we say 2 to 6 percent, this is what we are talking about. CPI rural urban combined should be 2 to 6 percent. <coughs> so, <coughs> CPI versus WPI. So, now there is one important applied concept that you have to understand. When we look at both CPI and WPI, what will we infer from it? Imagine CPI is high, but WPI is low. What can you tell? Probably inflation is happening where? Probably inflation is happening maybe at, at this stage that is consumer stage instead of you can say in other stages probably this retail price person is taking big profit. This is one possibility. Can you verify it? Yes, look at the data. What is the price at this level? What is the price at this level of all these items? You can verify it. Imagine that is not the cause. Then there is another possibility. Because we are giving higher weightage for food in CPI, because of increase in food prices also CPI may be more than WPI. Can we verify it? Yes, by looking at food prices separately, whether they have increased or not, we can verify it. If that is also not the case, then only one more possibility is left. Services cost has increased, which is not considered in WPI, but increased it is considered in CPI. These are the only three possibilities where CPI can be more and WPI can be less. So RBI will identify, pinpoint clearly what is the source of inflation by looking at both WPI and CPI. 
you understood we want more clarity to be able to you can say pinpoint even with more accuracy that is why we are trying to create ppi also when we compare all the three then it we will have even more accuracy in identifying what exactly is causing inflation you understood this <coughs> so here you can see wpa tracks at uh, producer level this part we saw they differ in wage weightages assigned to food fuel and manufactured item cpi food weightage is much higher than wpa wpa does not capture in prices of services and rbi in 2014 adopted cpi as its key measure 2014 new government came to power and they, you can say we that was the end of any leaning towards ussr whatever was there that was the end and now complete you can say leaning is towards lpg era or mostly western type of dominated economy <coughs> some issues also are present with cpi it is not according to I mean WPI, globally nobody else is using WPI, that is one problem. Most countries are using either CPI or PPI. Then rates are captured from Mondays, which does not know, show how much actually people are paying. That is, that part we already saw, that is a normal common sense type of problem. Then uh, we started this only in 2011, that means we do not have all the data for all the previous decades. So we cannot do much analysis of what happens in India when El Nino happens, what happens to CPI. We could have done this sort of analysis if we had the data but we do not have it, that is one more problem. Then consumer prices are affected by subsidies, taxes, distribution cost. Finally, whatever the person is paying in the end, everything will affect this pay, price. That is one more problem with, you can say, <coughs> I mean, this is problem with CPI. <coughs> then problem with WPI, it is, I mean, this part we already saw. And uh, one more problem with WPI we already discussed, that is, it, it has double counting or multiple counting bias. <coughs> Producer price index, earlier there were Abhijit Sen committee, Golder committee also. Recent committee you can remember only one, that is Ramesh Chand committee in 2019 has been set up for recommending how to create this W, I mean PPI. So far we have not implemented it, but Ramesh Chand committee has given its report on, you can say, how this PPI should be introduced. <coughs> Why we are trying to create PPI? Because in many countries they already have this PPI and it is easier for international comparison if we have this PPI, then it will include services, whereas WPI will not include services. We have not yet created so far, but other countries, the, you know, PPI includes services. If you should be able to compare with them, we should also have this services or not. That means we will probably have services within this PPI. And it removes this multiple counting bias that is there in WPI, it will not consider intermediate goods. Comparison between CPI, PPI, if you look at it, it will, even WPI also, we can pinpoint exactly where inflation is happening. This is, these are all the advantages of PPI. <coughs> Coming to inflationary gap and deflationary gap. <coughs> Here, this part is precursor to fiscal policy which we will start now, I mean after, after this. So, so far we have seen monetary policy, this part everybody is clear how monetary policy tries to control the economy. Fiscal policy means it is government's policy. Initially, we saw monetary policy's responsibility is to control inflation. Fiscal policy's responsibility is to focus on growth. But sometimes, if a monetary policy is unable to control inflation, fiscal policy also tries to control inflation. How does it do it? Fiscal policy has only two instruments. It will try to spend more money, that is expenditure, or it will try to tax people, that is, you can say tax. Tax and expenditure are only two instruments and it are very simple. There is nothing more complex in, you can say, fiscal policy. It is much more simple actually compared to monetary policy. So how does government control the economy? Imagine government wants to push more money into the economy. What should it do to taxes? Reduce the taxes so people will remain with more money. What should it do to expenditure? Increase expenditure so that people have more money. This is how government controls money supply in the economy. This is fiscal policy with which government controls money opposite of this exactly is if they want to reduce money supply increase the taxes and reduce the spending so right now imagine come to inflationary and deflationary gap excess of total government spending above national income is known as inflationary gap this kind of thing we will discuss later imagine government has totally collected 100 rupees as tax and everything from the economy right now government feels that we need to push a little more money into the economy so that economy is revived and demand will increase so they will add extra 2 rupees, they will print or bring a loan from outside or something and they will print it and they will, you can say, spend that money. Now 2 rupees extra comes into the economy. If 2 rupees extra comes, what happens to inflation? Is it going to increase or not? 
totally 100 rupees was there, 2 percent extra money is present. Whenever extra money is present in the economy, what happens to inflation? It will increase. That means the excess of total government spending, whatever has happened, it has the power to increase, in, you know, cause inflationary pressure. And that is what we call as inflationary cap. This 2 rupees will create an inflationary pressure. So, it will, when we bring extra money into the economy, inflationary pressure is created, that is what is inflationary gap. When we go for this inflationary gap, when we have some sort of a recession because of COVID or some other problem, demand is low, we want to increase demand, then government will take extra loans or government will print a little bit extra currency and actually spend it, then they will create this inflationary gap. In a recession situation, growth has reduced. If growth is low, in a normal situation, what would be inflation? it will also be low because inflation anyway is low. We can afford to spend a little extra money because inflation is also near zero and it will come back maybe to 3 or 4 percent still manageable. But when we cannot do this is in a stagflation situation because then what happens? If we increase the inflation, then inflation will go out, can say out of control, we don't want that to happen. So this is the meaning of inflationary gap. Deflationary gap by now you can expect, it is very simple. Deflationary gap means exact opposite of this. As of now, inflation is too high, maybe 8 percent, 9 percent. RBI it is trying, but it is unable to control it. So what government can do is increase taxes so that we take out more money, reduce expenditure so that more money will not go to people. Imagine government has taxed people totally, whatever it is, 100 rupees has taken out from the economy, only 98 rupees in the economy. That means 2 rupees has been removed from the economy. What happens to inflation? it will reduce and that 2 rupees whatever reduction it will create deflationary pressure is created. We are going in that direction, it is not exactly deflation, deflationary pressure means in the direction of reduction of inflation and that is what we are calling as deflationary pressure. It reduces overall money supply, shortfall in total spending of government over the national income is called as deflationary gap. You understood this. This is related to fiscal policy. So. <coughs> You understood what is inflationary gap and deflationary gap? Any questions so far? Okay, yeah. Correct, yes. Correct. So, fiscal policy is focusing on growth. That means they are trying to add more money into the economy, remove, keep more money in the hands of people. So, their main aim is not? Like their major aim is not inflation. Inflation is primary goal of RBI, right? So, that means it is possible that actually inflation will increase because of this, whatever they have done. <coughs> yeah. So, if it is under control, then it is. What is the healthy level of inflation? Multiple committees have recommended 4 to 6 percent, but right now we already saw that 2 to 6 percent is what we are trying to keep. Chakravarti Tarapur has recommended that it should be between 4 and 6 percent. So, why it should be between this level only? So, this part I think we briefly discussed it a little. Consider from producer's perspective, if inflation is, if you want the producer or even investor, if inflation is 2 to 6 percent, you will feel that slight inflation is there, that means demand is more or supply is more? Demand, demand is more means will you produce or not? Yes. Investor will feel that demand is more, producer is producing, will you invest or not? Yes. yes, that means this is good for the economy. Imagine inflation is 20 percent, producer will feel if I produce this and I get the money by then my money value would have reduced because 20 percent inflation means 20 percent loss there. So that means not producing more, not investing more. Imagine inflation is minus 10 percent. Then that means demand is more or supply is more? Supply. In supply is more, will you produce more or less? Yes. Less. That means less production is vicious cycle, less investment is vicious cycle. Imagine you are actually a buyer. If you are a buyer, if inflation is 2 to 6 percent, imagine your last year salary was 10 lakh, this year you are getting 11 lakh. Car value last year was 10 lakh, this year it is 11 lakh. You will feel as my salary increases, car value also keeps on increasing, there is no point in waiting to buy a car. So whenever you buy it is same, so you will buy the car. Imagine last year to this year your salary increased but your car price reduced. Then you will feel maybe if I wait one more year the car price will reduce further. 
and that means buyers will put off buying decisions in a deflationary situation they will postpone buying decisions if buyers are postponing buying decisions what happens to the economy demand will actually reduce that is not good for the economy it creates a vicious cycle if it is you can say somewhere here healthy level of inflation they will feel anyway whenever i buy it it is same and they will buy it. when inflation is too much my salary increased only 1 lakh car price increased 2 lakh then i can't afford this car anymore that means they will not buy it you understood from the perspective of producers investors and buyers also everybody's perspective if you look at it if we have to remain in virtuous cycle inflation has to be in the middle of here between 2 to 6% if it is goes too much or if it goes too low this is why we call it as overheating of the economy or freezing of the economy or something when it freezes no virtuous cycle when it overheat heats also no virtuous cycle there is an optimum engine temperature there is an optimum level of inflation where virtuous cycle works you understood <coughs> so producers feel there is demand produce more consumers feel price rise steadily and predictably don't put off buying decision in textbooks they have used this word putting off means postponing same word i have given because in exam they may give same word post they will not postpone buying decisions investment is forthcoming as there is indication of healthy demand in the economy because more investors want to invest borrowers benefit when inflation is you can say high even here also borrowers will probably borrow but they are not producing they are not investing so then virtuous cycle will stop there if it is negative they will not borrow here they will borrow here they will borrow you understood this so considering all these factors healthy level of inflation should always be there <coughs> in the economy so this part is summation of whatever we have discussed it is very simple even when interest what happens because of interest rates and you know loans this is it is there is nothing new in this part so uh, i think these two slides you can this also expansionary contractionary whatever we discussed these three slides you can discuss you can read by yourself if you have any questions in tomorrow's class you can ask in those three slides i will explain only that part look at this question which of the following is likely to be most inflationary in its effect the question is most repayment of public debt government make a loan people now they will pay back this money to people it may create inflation or it may not create inflation probably we don't know maybe it will not create it is not very high so you can say borrowing from public to finance a public def, you know, budget deficit we are taking money from people spending money back in the economy also in similar level borrowing from banks to finance a budget deficit banks also it is not very different we are taking from the economy and spending back in the economy also similar level creation of new money to finance a budget deficit if we create new money then it will definitely create more inflation most inflation is created here you understood imagine this option was not there then we have to search where what exactly happens in more detail but because this option is there we don't need to go into that level of detail if this is not there then you have to think about where money is moving from rich people to poor people so the propensity to consume is more in poor and that means velocity of circulation is more and that will create more inflation you understood this so in options try to identify simplest answer usually is the correct answer in upsc exam simplest logic if you try to over complicate it majority of the time 8 out of 10 times it will be wrong answer yes 2 out of 10 times you will get it right but for that you cannot lose other eight questions <coughs> then liquidity trap this is also important um, so <coughs> liquidity trap means consider the metaphor that we have considered earlier in this aeroplane two pilots are there one is fiscal policy that is one another is monetary policy imagine as of now there is a recession some sort of problem has occurred covid recession in this covid recession because of how to get out of recession what should what should rbi do reduce the interest rates when we reduce the interest rates people will take more loans investment will increase and production will increase demand will. that is the goal that is the idea but when rbi reduces interest rates because of recession in newspaper every day it says somebody remove 20000 employees another person remove 30000 employees people are afraid that they will lose their jobs ideally they wanted to buy a car they wanted to buy a bike house etc but right now they are not really sure maybe whether this is the right time to do it because if they try to now take a loan and buy a car if they lose their job then what happens then there is a problem so what they will do is they will think maybe we let us postpone it let us see later and at this point even if rbi reduces interest rates also interest rate is not the decision criteria for this person right now whether the person will remain in his job or not is the criteria based on which he will make decision 
if people are not going to remain in job they will not spend much if bikes and cars are not sold even businesses are making losses they will feel whether we should take more loans to produce and they will also not take loans you understand what is happening is ideally rbi should be able to influence the banks to give more loans rbi has reduced rates banks also have reduced rates but people are in some sort of a confusion they are unable to decide whether to take this loan or not and that means they won't take much loans loan off take is hit off take means loan taking from this bank is not happening because right now the interest rate is not the criteria based on which they will take decisions and what has happened to monetary policy right now it has become ineffective imagine among the two pilots one pilot is unconscious then who should take responsibility of this plane the other plane that is government only fiscal policy is working right now only fiscal policy can control inflation and achieve growth both at this time and this situation is called as liquidity trap liquidity trap is when monetary policy has become ineffective usually when does it occur it occurs during a recession before a recession after a recession around a recession is when usually liquidity trap occurs you understood this liquidity trap is a situation when expansionary monetary policy that is increase in money supply does not increase the loan off take off take means people are not taking out these loans from the banks number of loans taken are not increasing investment is not increasing hence does not stimulate demand and growth that is not happening when does it occur usually happens around a severe recession around a recession means before after during this is when it will happen families and businesses are afraid to spend no matter how much credit is available because they are not very confident about their economic future so at this point they don't want to take unnecessary loans and that is where liquidity trap occurs you understood the meaning of liquidity trap so during liquidity trap actually they will try to reduce the interest rates further but that is not the cause of liquidity low low interest rates very low interest rates are effect of liquidity trap in fact in europe they went to the extent of making interest rates negative after liquidity trap occurred negative means what if you take loan we will only give you the money then also people are not taking loans negative interest rate means they are saying see you take a loan minus 1% we will give 1% every month to you so and where will they get the money depositors are also getting negative interest rate if you want to keep the money in the bank you have to pay 2% to us you understood so the objective was nobody is spending money depositors should take them out because take the money out and spend it because they are losing money and more people should take the loans of whatever is there in the bank because they are going to gain money this was the idea and they temporarily created for a few months this negative interest rates in europe european central bank did it after 2012 financial crisis in europe because of liquidity trap you understood this <coughs> so <coughs> similar to liquidity trap unemployment trap is also a term used in economics but that is not as complex it is very simple people in developed countries they get unemployment benefits benefits means if you are a, if a person is unemployed imagine government is giving monthly some 10000 15000 or something as income in uk in us they do this this is called unemployment benefit if a person is getting this 10000 15000 they feel why should i go to work anyway because i am getting it so that means it creates a trap where a person will perpetually remain unemployed this is called as unemployment trap unemployment benefit is discouraged i am unemployed to go to work in developed countries mostly this is happening because developing countries have not reached that level where they will give unemployment benefits to people so only there we see it more it reduces production and gdp also because people are not uh, going to work productivity of labor is also reduced that means they are not trying to improve their skills or get into you can say jobs etc what governments have tried to do to solve this problem is they will say see if you lose the job we will give unemployment benefits only for 6 months it is your responsibility to get another job within 6 months somehow they have tried to limit it and also some conditional means as long as you are attending interviews and showing proof to government i attended this interview i did not get the job they will continue to give in 6 months at least two interviews you should attend so the france i think has created this sort of condition so that means by creating conditions and by limiting this unemployment benefits they are trying to address this unemployment trap you understood so even though they sound similar liquidity trap and employment trap are very different that means there is huge amount of difference in concept between them <coughs> double financial repression is a concept in economic survey <coughs> financial repression means people are saving money in the bank but they are not getting good returns 
when does this happen? 4% bank is giving, inflation is 8%, how much are they getting? Minus 4%, this is called as financial repression. Financial repression means savings getting low returns. Usually it happens with inflation, in every country it happens. But in India, one more extra double second factor has been created. Because the NPS have increased and bank is facing losses. What bank is doing is they are deliberately reducing the 4% has been reduced to 3%. That is another reason why you can say savings are earning even lesser interest. That is the second factor added. That is what economic survey is calling it as double financial repression. So on asset side, asset means from bank's asset side, government has mandated SLR, PSL, along with that they have NPS. Because of this reason, you can say they are earning less profit. So they can give less to depositors. On liability side, that means deposit side, because whatever they are giving inflation is reducing that interest also to this person. You can say what depositors are getting has, has reduced drastically. In India, when what depositors are getting has reduced in real terms because of high inflation and both this both of these problems, what will depositors do? They will take out the money. When they take out the money, what happens in the economy? It reduces overall money supply, it reduces money multiplier effect, reduces money supply, reduces virtuous cycle, it may even create vicious cycle if it goes to that extent. You understood this? Because once money is taken out, banks cannot create money multiplier effect with that money. And that means overall how much money is present in the economy reduces. <laughs> yeah. So if they consume more, what, is the, what are they consuming is also important. If they are consuming, imagine uh, gold or real estate if they are buying then that will create a smaller economy within gold and real estate only. It will not actually benefit the whole the bigger economy. So that is what happens actually in India. It will go into assets like gold and real estate because they feel money is, we are unable to get good returns here, let us invest in gold or let us buy land. <coughs> you understood? <coughs> so this is double financial repression. <coughs> Coming to index of industrial production, this is also an index. When you look at the name index by now, consumer price index means it is one number which shows inflation. Now you can easily identify by looking at the name itself. Index of industrial production means what does it? What should it show? How much actual production is happening in the country? This is what it should show. IIP measures the quantum of changes in industrial production and economy, captures general level of activity. How much production is happening? It will try to capture. Base year is always given value of 100 everywhere it is same, we already saw. And IIP series base year is 2011-12. In IIP also what exactly we are doing production, industrial production in India, we change the, keep changing the basket because what we produce will also keep changing over time. So if the current IIP reads 116, it means if 100 rupees worth of products were produced in the base year, right now we are producing 116 rupees worth of product. 16 percent growth has happened compared to the base year. IIP is a short term indicator, that means it will be able to give uh, data within six weeks. Imagine in January, uh, first week we produced something. By February second week, we will get the data with regard to whatever production has happened in January first week. That means for decision making, it is relatively easy. So IAP is a short term indicator of industrial growth till the results from annual survey of industry and national account statistics are available. Actually accurate data is released by annual survey of industry. But the problem is, it will take a lot of time by the time this data is released. That means, it is actually taking two year delay by the time it releases data. Imagine you are, you are riding the airplane and the instrument is showing one hour delay in whatever it is showing actually in an environmental condition. Is there any use of, you can say, seeing whatever, you know, past data. When you are taking real time decisions, even if the data is not accurate, it has to be fast. And that means, that is why IIP is used for decision making. Annual survey of industry which comes later, it is used for only post facto analysis. That means once the data comes, we will just do analysis on what happened last year and previous year. So there is a trade off between speed and accuracy. If we want data very quickly, it is not very accurate data. If we want very accurate data, we, do, we cannot get it fast. You understood? <coughs> so who is compiling it? CSO can change it to NSO right now and implementation with a time lag of six weeks. So IIP, this part is important, 
IIP has three sub parts. Highest is manufacturing weightage after that electricity after that mining. This type of questions are asked. Below this all these things are not important for us. But under IIP these three things you can remember in order. <coughs> then ASI, we just discussed that there is a two year delay in ASI. ASI is actually principal source of statistics. It will consider now it is NSO, who will release this. So it usually it covers only organized sector, data comes with a tag of two years. Unorganized sector, NSSO used to collect it, now NSSO is also part of NSO, it has been merged. Every five years once it will just do estimation of how much is actually happening in unorganized sector using sample survey. So actually this CS is as of now, this ASI it will only consider um, organized sector and there are many exceptions. Why there is exceptions are there are different, different exception is given for different reasons. We do not need to know for UPSC exam, but if you know what is the difference between this IIP and annual survey of industry in general, then it is enough to be able to answer questions. This part we just discussed that merger of a both has happened to create uh, <coughs> CSO. <coughs> then index of 8 core industries. So it shows how much production volume is happening in what we consider as core industries. These core industries are a proxy for infrastructure in India. If core industries are performing well, then infrastructure per sector is performing well in India. So it is monthly this data is released, actually 40% of entire industrial production is happening in this core industries itself, IIP 40%. Who is releasing it? Office of Economic Advisor, Minister of Commerce and Industry is releasing it. <coughs> so which are the 8 core industries in their order of weightage? This question has already been asked I think once in UPSC exam. Try and remember using some sort of acronym or something in the same order as uh, you can say whatever their weightage is. This is a factual question. If you can remember, you can remember it. If you feel it is too much of effort, uh, then you can put the same effort in other things also it is fine. It is not mandatory to remember pure factual information in economics. In other subjects maybe it is important, but here it is fine. <coughs> base year we already discussed what is it. Every base year, every index's base year is usually given a value of arbitrary value of 100, so that it is easier for comparison. Change in base year means new base year whenever we take it, it is given 100 value. From there it will keep on increasing, basket also we change. But how to choose a base year? To choose a base year. First it should be recent, why it should be recent? Because basket should be recent otherwise there is no use of having base year. Second, it should not be a recession year or boom year because if it is a recession year the base year will have base effect or not. This imagine if it is a boom year then also it will have base effect. To prevent this base effect it should be a normal year, it should not be either a recession year or a boom year. Then it should have normal monsoon. Inter Indian civilization actually is dependent on monsoon. Most people only think that agriculture is dependent on monsoon, but if monsoon is good, agriculture is good, then farmers will get more income, then farmers will buy more manufactured products and services also. And also many of the agricultural products are raw materials into manufacturing. And when manufacturing wages increase because of increased raw materials, then services sales will also increase. So that means you can see that there is a ripple effect of monsoon on agriculture, manufacturing services, all sectors. So it has to be a mon normal monsoon year if it has to be a normal year in Indian economy. Monsoon is actually you can say affecting all aspects of Indian economy directly or indirectly. Then if you have done some major reform like say GST implementation, demonetization or whatever like this then it will also have affected the numbers, it will create base effect because the base year has not been normal. So to prevent all these things we want a normal year. Problem is since 2011-12 this year we want to change it but we have not been able to find a proper normal year to change it. That is why we have delayed you can say changing of base year in recent times. Every year is interesting in some manner, it has not been normal at all. So maybe there is COVID or maybe there is some sort of implementation, something else is happening. So because of all these reasons, we have avoided you can say changing the base year so far. Probably next year or year after that, hopefully it is a normal year at that time we will change it. Then purchasing managers index, purchasing manager means you can expect by now by looking at it, Manage, purchasing means, manager means this person is working in a factory somewhere or industry, purchasing manager means what is his probable responsibility, purchasing, usually what does an industry purchase raw materials, if a purchasing manager has to purchase raw materials based on what does he make his decision, how much production has to happen, how does they decide, how do they decide it? how much demand is present in the economy. 
So this person's one of his responsibility is to predict demand so that he can buy raw materials accordingly. Every purchasing manager across the country, they are all trying to predict demand in the country using their own methods. What government will do is they will just call them up and they will say, what is your prediction about demand? What have you learned from, you can say, your methods? So that means PMI, purchasing managers index is a survey based measure. Survey means we just call them up, lot of purchasing managers and we take a measure out of how they are feeling, their sentiment. So, it is an indicator of business activity both in manufacturing services. It is a survey based measure that asks the respondents about changes in their perception of some key business variable. In their perception, what do they think that whether production is, I mean demand is going to increase by next month or not or it is going to reduce. If it is going to increase or reduce by how much, this is what they are going to ask the purchasing managers. So, it is calculated separately for the manufacturing and services sectors, then a composite index of both of them is created. How do they represent this? It is similar to pH scale. Anybody knows how acidity is represented? Acid or base? 7 is neutral. More than 7 is basic. Less than 7 is acidic. 7 to 6 is 10 times more acidic. 6 to 5 is 10 times more acidic. This is how the scale works. Similarly, right now we have created this purchasing managers index in such a way that 50 is neutral. Exactly same production as last month. 51 means slightly more production as last month, 49 means slightly less production as last month. So that means depending upon whatever score, imagine 35, drastically less production compared to last month. Imagine last month was 50, this month is 45, next month is 40, what is happening? Production is consistently reducing. What type of a cycle are we in? It is contraction, it is a vicious cycle. Imagine last month 50, this month 55, next month 60. It is a strong virtuous cycle, continuous increase in production is happening. You understood how purchasing managers index, a figure above 50 denotes expansion, anything below 50 contraction, higher the difference from the midpoint, greater the expansion or contraction. If the figure is higher than previous month, economy is expanding at a faster rate, lower than previous month, growing at a lower rate. Imagine 55, 55, 55, 3 months, production is increasing at the same rate. 55, 60, 65, production is increasing at a faster rate. You understood this. So, <coughs> this, <coughs> we can take 10, 10 more minutes. <laughs> you are saturated. <coughs> okay, we will take this. This part, remaining part is very simple, unemployment, poverty. After that, fiscal policy will take in next class. So, Tomorrow we can take uh, this part and we will start with uh, fiscal policy. What is your target of finishing this? Target, I think we will not be able to cover a whole syllabus like for example all the chapters. What I have done is prioritize whichever chapters are important. After fiscal policy I will cover uh, budget and all the associated spin off type of questions that are possible from budget. Then economic survey and similarly for economic survey. After that, current affairs, if miscellaneous are remaining apart from whatever I have discussed here, that I will discuss. And how much time are you going to allot for budget and survey? Budget and survey probably will take one or two classes, two classes maybe. So, we will continue tomorrow. Thank you.